Okay, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today, we're not going to be painting because we're going to be celebrating your paintings. This is one of my favorite things that we do because it's an opportunity for me to <laughs> not have to do any painting for a little bit, of, well, even though I love painting, but it's kind of nice to take a little bit of a break, and taking a break can be a really good thing. It kind of helps regenerate some batteries. Uh, but for me, it's super exciting because I get to take a little bit of time to look at what you guys have been doing. So most of the time I'm sort of broadcasting out into the world, wondering if anybody's listening. Here I get to actually see what you guys are doing, reflect on it a little bit, and celebrate your achievements. So let's get started right here. So just a, as a quick little reminder, if you're new to the channel, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and as always, join the Facebook group. The link is in the description below, because that's how I got all of the artwork that you we're going to see here in just a few minutes. And if you make, if you feel that anything I have to say is is helpful on your creative journey, then here's some ways that you can help support the channel financially. If you like, for as little as a dollar, there's also the if you see a little dollar sign by where you can comment. That's how you can donate via directly through YouTube. Okay, so. A few things I want to start off with at the beginning are some great artworks that you guys have created in uh, solidarity with Ukraine and the ongoing conflict there and the Russian invasion. And uh, these mean a lot to me, being a Ukrainian myself, so I really appreciate uh, those of you who are uh, making donations. When we in our two episodes we talked about different ways that you can make donations to the human uh, UN Human Rights Council, UNICEF, the Red Cross, and so on and so forth. Doctors Without Borders, all great organizations. I strongly encourage you to make a donation if you if you have the means to do so. But I think also showing your support by making artworks is you know it's a great way of just sort of reflecting about our own freedom, what freedom means to you and being grateful for the opportunity to be able to express ourselves, right? So here's a great one by Allison here. I love the dove over the Ukrainian flag. That is so beautiful. And then here's Deborah's here, did one of sunflowers. That is beautiful, I love that. I love these um, kind of out of focus bouquet balls lights that kind of appear in the background that's really cool because it really brings our attention to the flowers in the foreground really cool idea deborah here's another one with the sunflower that's sort of flowing out into the ukrainian flag that's really creative i haven't seen that before that's really neat i guess this was maybe a fundraiser painting that this was done for very cool i love that Here's another one here. Heidi did one using the collage methods. I think this is while we were doing the Matisse cutouts. Heidi got inspired to do one with cutouts, but rather than the Matisse image did her own thing, which I think is also really cool, right? The idea is that we learn some of these techniques and then you can do with them what you will. That turned out really cool. I love the way even, you know, one might say could be frustrated with the, it not gluing down perfectly. But the fact that some of the corners or edges are peeling up a little bit actually I think works really well. It makes gives it that three-dimensional quality because obviously it is three-dimensional, but it sort of brings the, that flower into life. I love that, that's really cool. Ravi did one as well. I love this close-up, very dramatic composition here. Really beautiful, very cool. And then Charmé included the, uh, to, wanted to highlight a Ukrainian artist. So this is their artwork, Anatoly Metlin. And this is the original artwork. And then this is the one that uh, Charmé did in response to it, which I think is awesome. Really cool. So it looks like the original was done with palette knife. 
It also has like some digital, slight digital quality to it. I wonder, I could, is it done? It could have been done on the computer or started on the computer and finished. Cause some of these, cause I've been spending so much time drawing on my iPad, but it, you know, who knows? It could be done on the computer, printed out and then finished uh, with actual paint on canvas. And Shermay also included a little bit of um, information on their biography. That is awesome. Congratulations. Thank you, everyone, for your, your solidarity and your support. It means a lot to me in, in as much as, as important as that might be. But really for the people around the world, especially in Ukraine, who are fighting for their lives and for their country is uh that is awesome i really really appreciate that next i wanted to just sort of show an image that this is a photograph that maria uh, did an interpretation of uh, I'm not, maybe a few months ago and then based on some of the feedback did a, a new version of this drawing which i think turned out really cool and just sort of based on the feedback that, that I had given and maybe some other people also on in our Facebook group. And wow, what a, there's it, two very different drawings. I mean, it's almost hard to believe they're by the same person. And you know, I honestly, I like both of them a lot. So just, so saying which one is better than the other, you know, it's interesting, this one, which I, I believe was the first one, because we talked about this one before, because um, I think Maria might have had some concerns about some of the perspective in here. Uh, I What I do like, I, I like how dark it is. We get some really dark values, these dark blacks. And, oops, let's go back to this one. Um, I can understand it, you know, it was a little bit wonky with some of the brick work in here. But I also really like the, there's, there is a certain speed that I feel in the mark making that is very attractive. I really like just the way that all the attention to the bricks, but that they're done in relatively like, there's a speed that they're done, even kind of the scribbling in the bushes, which I find I, I, I also really like, which is contrasts kind of dramatically with this one, which is far more well organized using some principles of perspective in here, which make it a little bit more of an organized space. And then the way that the bricks are treated, you know, we can see how things recede really well to different vanishing points. So, I mean, I don't know. They're both really beautiful. Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know if I could say one is better than the other, Maria. Um, one, th you know, I do really like the dark, dark values in here, which we don't have quite so dramatic contrasts in here. Makes me think we could potentially even darken in and around some of these contours and some of the shadows a little bit. The lines in the sky are also really cool quite an addition because before we just had this blank space in the sky now we have all these dramatic diagonal lines which are awesome the one thing is that because we have these sort of cables i don't know if they're power cables or you know uh, telephone cables television cables etc is that they when i first saw them i thought oh wow there's a lot of like electric cables <laughs> over this square or this, uh, you know, um, stair, you know, pathway or whatever. So that just sort of immediately caught my eye. That that use of those diagonals in here when there's already that cable led for just a momentary confusion in my part, in, in my mind. Um, I don't mind it. It does, it's it does add like a lot of information in the sky that wasn't there previously. So I'm curious, I guess that that's supposed to be sun rays. And then there's also these di diagonals here. So really interesting choices. 
I mean, they're both really cool. I really like how they were done. And I'm, I'm also just really excited that someone listened to my advice and, and took the time to do a second version of this artwork. Very, very cool. And then I also just want, just before we move on, I just wanted to highlight, here's Tanya, who I believe is, is one of our newer members of the community and doing the color wheel as part of that first five episodes intro to painting series. I love the color wheel. I think they said they weren't so happy with the the neutral core being a little bit off center, but well, I think it looks fine. <laughs> I actually think we could push this neutral core because it's still kind of brownish to a bit more of a gray. Uh, again, several different ways of going about it, but if we took this combination of colors or cool blue and warm red and had maybe a little bit of cool yellow to it, I think we'll get much more closer to a gray. Okay, awesome. That's a great start to uh, to the, come on here. So what I wanna move on to, I wanna start by picking up where we left off last time. And I wanna look at the art that we did based on the paintings of Vincent Van Gogh. And you can see th these are the Van Gogh paintings that we made for Halloween. This is a famous Van Gogh painting, Skeleton with Cigarette. And so maybe we'll start here with Vanya on the bottom and work our way in reverse alphabetical order. Uh, is there a difference between those? I don't think so. Wow, Sandra. Paula. Maria, Leslie, cool, wow, oh, I love the drawing, Gemini, Gail, and Eleanor, wow, so let's just flip through these again real quick, because I always think it's kind of neat just to see them sort of flash by on the screen, let's make that bigger, just, yeah, those are not exactly the same. So um, let's just start here with with uh, Vanya's painting. I think this turned out really good. One thing I would say is I think we could push the background to be a little bit darker. Right now it's kind of gray, so it looks like we can't. It looks like you know how to mix your darkest color, your the black, because I, I I don't think this is a black. I think this is the color when we mix it ourselves, as we just talked about momentarily ago, for our neutral core, right? Um, and then obviously adding white to it is how we get this gray. Uh, I mean, Van, I mean, it's fine as it is, but you know, Van Gogh did have a darker background, so that might be something to consider. Uh, but otherwise, it looks really good. I mean, there is still a bunch of this warm yellow. I think that's from the Imprimatura layer, which kind of adds something neat. Um, and I think it actually if we had an even darker background, I think it would pop even more, um, like those yellows, because that contrast that we talk so much about in terms of value would really be pushed, and the more you push those those contrasts, the more you get things to pop. Here's Sandra's here, that's wild. So I don't know what the context behind this one is. It's, it's strange that it's sort of very uh, fuzzy, so I'm sure Sandra probably there's a explanation on the Facebook group about this and we have these kind of pinkish bones uh, it does sort of make me feel like this is a skeleton that still has a little bit of meat left on it as disturbing as that might be um, I wonder if this is still in the state of process and, and Sandra's still working on it I'm not sure um I mean, this is a deceptively difficult painting, and I think I, I did it pretty quickly. Uh, so it is, there's a lot, doing any painting of any kind of skeleton, which we do in school, the school that I teach at is one of the activities we do. And sometimes we spend like eight or nine hours over the course of a week doing, executing a painting like this, because it takes a while to, to make those distinguishing values when we're painting something that's you know, like bone, which is maybe all white or, you know, ver different variations of, of white. 
So you don't have, it's not like you're, you have reds and greens and blues to help make that contrast. You're doing very subtle changes here. So it makes me think maybe Sandra had a little bit of difficulty kind of getting into some of those areas here. But, I, but it is a, a pretty weird painting too. And I mean that always in the best way. I love weirdness. Weirdness is what I'm always looking for in art. I, I really encourage people to embrace that about themselves and their artwork. Paula's wow. That is wild, Paula. I love that this it all has a bit of a grin, that skeleton. And uh, that's, wow, that's cool. Yeah, again, like sometimes all these bones start to kind of jumble up a little bit. And in fairness, mine wasn't anatomically correct because I was painting off of Van Gogh's, which I don't think was quite anatomically correct as well. I mean, I've taught anatomy many times and I think I probably talked about that while we were doing the painting is that you know, if he had been a student in my class, I would have asked him to clarify a few things there. But I really like how this turned out. And also the colors, too. Nice kind of, some of these greens in there also give it that kind of macabre kind of quality. That's wild. Maria, that is really cool. I like that. That turned out really well. Um, I don't think I have as many comments here. I mean, again, I have to look at the original and what I did, because I, <laughs> I can't remember. There's some... I think that's the opposite shoulder. These are collarbones, I think. Again, I think part of that is due to Van Gogh's, you know, maybe slight confusion with the, the figure. He didn't really paint that many bones and skeletons before. Here's Leslie's. Wow. That's cool. Again, that, that kind of grin. This really reminds me of an artist uh, named James Ensor. And let me just see if I can... Who's an artist that I'd like to tackle one of these days. Um, and James Ensor, let me see if we can just find some of his images. Has like a real... Um, well, let's look at some of his maybe skeletons. He, he has this really brushy quality that, that makes him sort of seem... He's on the kind of the, the fringe of, of um, impressionism and expressionism and facilitating back and forth there. These very fleshy colors, pinks and oranges and peachy colors. There's a, a beautiful, incredible painting. This painting here is in the uh, Getty Museum in Los Angeles collection. So if you're ever there, you got to check that out. It's beautiful. Anyway, this is just some way that, that, that Leslie, that you applied paint here, really reminded me of James Ensor right off the top of my head. And this is the drawing that you did. Oh, I love these kind of, you know, very Van Gogh spirals of the bones and how you... You swirl them out. Very creative. Really love that approach. Very cool, Leslie. Uh, Gemini. Wow, that has also turned out really good. I like, you know, the contrasts in these these values, the lights and the darks, really pushing that. Um, again, I'll have to take a look. I think maybe that again, it could just be my weird teaching, <laughs> but. Um, I do think that's really effective, especially in the skull itself. Really nice job in here of the jaw. And Gale, wow. So there's a lot lot more subtlety, less pushing of the values. But again, it actually reminds me a little bit of James Ensor in the way that uh, you've painted some of this, this stuff in here. Like I think we could clarify a little bit of shadow underneath the jawbone and probably underneath the, the cheekbones up here. But I also just really like these colors. Really, I, it turned out really nice, and just color-wise. Wow. Eleanor, that is cool. So th this is probably the most refined of all the ones we have, where you've really gone in and, and done a little bit more outlining and a lot more of these, um, like, shading on the bones to give them more volume and to round them out. That probably took you a little bit of time to do all that. 
but but very effective, right? It certainly paid off. Really nice. I almost feel like we could even push a little bit of the darker value, a little outlining in that eye and around the nose here, just to pop that nose, which you could darken in here or even just lighten a little bit. I can't remember again what the original is like, but I mean, just uh, with everything I'm saying, nitpicking a little bit in just to try to um, maybe highlight areas that, that we could improve on, right? As uh, as because I think we're all just trying to get better and better as we go, right? Great stuff. Okay, let's continue on here. I want to look at the art of Rembrandt. We don't have too many. I think there's only three people did the Rembrandt. Here's Eleanor again, who we just looked at. I love the subtlety in here. Oh, wow, and Joshua, that's great. And Paula, <laughs> that is awesome. It's funny, Paula, yours all of a sudden reminds me of like a soccer player. I don't know who, I don't, I don't I'm not that big of a soccer fan, but I don't know, it's a good little Diego Maradona kind of poofy hair there. And the sort of, the, the way that this kind of collar is cut, and he's he's quite muscular and and uh, a robust uh, young man in this picture. <laughs> this looks like a, a soccer jersey, which again, I love, I love all of that. That makes me really happy. Um, I also, I think you did a great job with the shadow on the face. I think to get even closer to Rembrandt, we'd even want to darken this more, right? Really pushing the shadow in there, which is what, what Rembrandt did, you know, as a bit of an experimentation with that theatrical lighting known as chiaroscuro, right? Another great Italian art word, chiaroscuro is that like very severe contrasts between light and dark right and you know we've we've talked about that before but even over the past few minutes of when we push those contrasts between light and dark we get a much more dramatic effect we also increase the the sense of space and volume in a picture and the way that Rembrandt really used that throughout his work is one of the key I iconic parts of, of his practice but also of a lot of other artists in, of that era um, and probably most famously Caravaggio who really made the chiaroscuro um, effect most popular but I think you did a great job here I like that same thing Joshua I like how you darken that down like I think same sort of thing like these eyes Paula are just a little bit too white too bright and if we just sort of darken them down, kind of like what Joshua's done, so they're, it's very subtle. You know, um, it's sort of like what we're talking about, the skeleton, and we have those white bones, and to try to, to, to get the subtlety between all those different whites to give volume is tricky, right? This is almost the opposite, because now we're talking about deep shadow, and how do we, how do, how do we have that dark shadow that's going all over across the face while still be able to see details, right? So that was this was a, a more difficult painting for sure. And I remember while we were painting it, getting comments or people like, "Why is it so dark? Why would anybody make a painting like this?" <laughs> Which um, you, you you could probably say of almost every painting. Why would anybody do this? It's crazy. I think Eleanor, you really nailed it here. You've got this almost too much almost the, the 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 features are so subtle that we really start to lose them a little bit like the lips are almost gone we could see the eyes um, but you know the, like the way that I made the painting and I'm not saying this is the best way of doing it is I basically painted the face and then just kept glazing and darkening and darkening and darkening so all of those features are there. They're just under progressive levels of, of shadow, which is the same, which is what happens for any of us, right? If I put a shadow on my face, it's not as if my eyes disappear. They're still there. They're just covered in shadow, right? So that is one of the things that artists, you know, 
like Rembrandt, Caravaggio would do. So they would use that very dramatic theatrical lighting, but they would still paint the figure in the darkness, which, and because what happens, what's very satisfying about seeing those paintings in real life is that you, you might walk into the room and it does just look like someone's head is coming out of the shadow and you just see maybe the head and the rest of the body is bathed in darkness. But if you stand and look at those paintings for a while and your eyes sort of adjust, acclimatize to the light, especially paintings that are lit under um, natural light, it's like the rest of the body starts to kind of emerge from the shadow and you can kind of see it and that's really cool. Right, those are those are actual techniques that artists developed purposefully back in the day when all we had was natural lighting, maybe some candles. But if you go see some of the great museums like the Uffizi in Florence, you see this all the time because most of the, the paintings in those great older museums are very light sensitive, so they're only lit by by daylight, which is also you know there's UV coatings on the windows. And so a lot of those paintings, you know, if you, you get the guidebook and you're like, wow, I can see like the birth of Venus by Botticelli. You know, you see the, in the guidebook, you could see all the details in it, but when you stand in front of it, the whole thing looks like it's, it's very dark. And you have to kind of look and you're like, huh, where's, there's two people in the, in front of some trees there. Oh, and it's like they kind of reveal themselves. And you have to remember, this is 500 years ago. It's, this is before television. This is before the internet. This is before movies, where you might be, you might sit and look at a painting for two or three hours, and you might just observe it. And it's like a movie is sort of things are unfolding from the different shadowy areas, and that is, I think, just super, super cool. Okay. Great work on these Rembrandts, you guys. I love it. So, um, speaking of Paula here, we're going to move on to Guy Fawkes. Um, we did this for uh, Guy Fawkes Day, which is a, a kind of a, a big holiday celebration time in the United Kingdom, in England. And obviously this image has become very famous uh, from uh, from V for Vendetta, the comic book and subsequent movie, but also you see people wearing masks like this at protests, and it's funny we haven't seen this mask during the the whole Ukraine uh, war right now, which is kind of a good thing because I'm I'm actually really glad that we're not seeing as much as I like this image, and obviously I chose to use it for. It is sort of because of its maybe satirical origin, well not origin, but at least the way it's been used more recently, I think it could, could sort of maybe undermine the seriousness of the situation. So I'm, I mean, just thinking off the top of my head, because we've seen, you know, in the, uh, you know, these various protests against the G20 and G7, you know, riots, and you often see protesters wearing these masks, so that's, I'm actually kind of good that this kind of image has sort of maybe disappeared for a short period of time here. Okay, so let's continue motoring right along here. I want to look at the art of uh, Edward Hopper. So this is, I love Edward Hopper. I put him in my top ten favorite artists of all time. And it looks like this episode inspired a number of other people to really explore his work as well. So we have Maria's painting here. Well, actually, let's just kind of zip through them. Wow, Paula. And then Sandra has got sort of a, a number of photos showing some of the process. And then uh, Heidi also did a different painting rather than the Nighthawks. And Holly also, this is the original by Edward Hopper that Holly's been working on. I think there's the background here. And this is the original, the window, and her version of it as well. So let's just kind of go back up to the Nighthawks. 
talk about that to start. Excuse me. Um, wow. Really cool job, Maria. You know, what I like about this is, you know, there's the details in the faces are kind of tricky to do at this scale. When we're working on like a 9x6 canvas, trying to get noses and mouths, you know, we're talking details that are less than a millimeter big. Right? That's really tricky to do. And sometimes doing those tiny little details can just make it more frustrating. And so I, I really applaud you, Maria, for actually just deciding, you know what? Rather than fiddle with all these little details, I think it's okay like this. And I absolutely agree. I think you did a fantastic job here. Really nice. Again, lots. There's This painting is another deceptively difficult painting in that there's a lot of very subtle shifts between colors. Uh, really, really nice. I think you did a great job here, Maria. Wonderful. And then here's Paula was working on this as well. Wow. Interesting. I like how, Paula, you, you actually made the figures bigger. You enlarged them and sort of made the... the almost like the window is, is taller, so we see more of the space and sort of brought us closer to that scene. Uh, as always... Paula, you're always drawing these things without using the templates, which is always just fantastically amazing. Um, great job with all these subtle transitions of colors. I also like this figure here. Uh, it almost looks like there's a someone wearing like a Hawaiian shirt or something. Is that just me? I mean, I, and again, I mean that on the, in the best way, but I love that you tried to get some of those details in there. I mean, everyone has a personality in there. That's great. And then we'll look at Sandra's here. Wow. Um, that's in progress. I think this is in progress. Prog I, think, I think these are done. I think that's when it's done. Let's take a look. Wow, you were able to get a lot of detail in there, Sandra. That is pretty amazing. That was tricky. Huh. Wow. Really good. Like even just like that hat and the shadow on the of the hat on the face and on the the what would you call this? What a soda jerk? Is that what they were called? Somebody working, selling soda and coffee, or I guess a, just a waiter. Um, but I think there was a, a specific term for someone who would who would work in a kind of a diner like this back in the day. Anyway, awesome job, all of you guys who attempted that painting. Bravo for sure. Let's look at Heidi's here. This is her version of. The, of the original Automat painting by Hopper, and it's very, very effective. Like, I mean, it really, in my mind, looks very close to the original. I, I should have taken a, an image of the original to show you, but um, really like this. Like, one of the cool things about this painting is that these are lights that are reflections on the window from inside, kind of maybe would be above our head. Um... So you've really done a pretty good job of getting the kind of the window and all of these different kinds of colors and reflections. Uh, and of course the figure is super strong because she's got one glove on, one glove off while she's having her tea or coffee. Love that. Great job. I, I always makes me really excited when someone is watching these episodes and gets really so inspired about an artist's work that they decide to investigate and start looking and doing their own research and finding other paintings that might appeal to them more. I certainly encourage everyone to do that as much as possible, right? Um, and then here's, this is the original Edward Hopper painting. And then I don't think Holly's got one of it finished. So we just have these details. So this is... Let's see, we'll zoom in on, on this fellow here. I think it's Holly who talks about using uh, hand sanitizer and a Q-tip for cleaning. 
because I think that's what uh, she might have done here to, you know, to clean that face potentially. It wasn't turning out the way that she wanted. Um, which, you know, I, I've I, again, I'm not. If I if it wasn't Holly, I apologize. Um, uh, but it is an interesting process. I've never heard of someone using hand sanitizer to wipe away acrylic paint that's dried on a canvas. Um, my immediate thought would be like, oh, I wonder how stable that, like, if that does anything to the painting that could potentially over time create an area that, um, in which the, the, the paint might continue to degrade over time because, you know, you're, you put that substance on and you can clean off that paint and it does a, a, it probably does a, obviously a good job of removing details, but unless there's all of that alcohol or whatever other substances in there, it could continue to eat away at the canvas or the paint, and then subsequent paint may or may not stick to it, or it might work like a bit of a resist and cause some of it to, to peel or bubble. The only time will, would tell. I, acrylic is one of the great things with acrylic is it is pretty sturdy. Like uh, unlike oil paint, which you really got to bear certain kind of strategies in mind to execute your painting properly. Acrylic, you can you can really kind of push pretty hard because essentially acrylic medium, you know, like the medium that we put into paint sometimes, and what is inside of your acrylic paint is is very similar chemically to white glue right so um so anyway that's just the, the first thing that comes to mind i think okay just maybe being very careful after you use that hand sanitizer and a q-tip just to really maybe even take a, a cloth with maybe just a little bit of water and just try to wipe any residue that may be there afterwards um, I'm sure if you talk to a, a, a curate, not a curator, a conservator about that, they may, they might have, they might either go like, whoa, <gasps> or like, yeah, actually, you know, that's fine. Well, I don't see any problem with that. So you never know. And you know, I know that probably most people are like, well, I'm not really concerned about this painting surviving a hundred years, but some people. But, you know, after you get a little bit hooked into painting, you start kind of maybe thinking, I do want it to last as long as possible. Wow. Cool. So I would love to... Holly, I don't know. I don't think you uploaded a, a finished version of uh, this Chop Suey painting by Hopper. So I would love to see the finished version. Very cool. Let's just keep on moving ahead here, folks. Uh, we'll now look at... Uh, Mary Ritter Hamilton, who we looked at for Remembrance Day, and Mary Ritter Hamilton probably. So let's let's look at her paintings first, or or the paintings that you guys did in recreating in response to hers. So here's Shelley's, Sandra's, Maria, Heidi, and Eleanor. Wow, let's zoom in on that one. These are great, you guys. So what we're looking at, for those of you who didn't do this painting or who weren't watching, th these are trenches in northern France after the war, shortly after the war, Mary Ritter, after World War One, Mary Ritter Hamilton was, was a not really an official war artist because women weren't allowed to be official war artists. I was an official war artist for uh, a long period of time um, up until recently. And um, she went around to the, all the major battlefields after World War I using her own money to go around and document all of those sites because she wanted people to be able to remember the horror and the sacrifice of all of the Canadian soldiers who died in those locations. And, you know, at the time the government was like, yeah, whatever, this is not a big deal. A lot of the work that she left is, some, in some cases, really the only 
artifacts that we have of what those locations look like. Anyway, this is a trench in um, northern France or Belgium. I'm trying to remember. Uh, that has been sort of overtaken by all these red poppies, which is would, must have been an incredible sight, and also just like a very melancholy experience, because obviously this is also where a lot of actual human blood was spilt, right? And seeing all these beautiful flowers in those is would be sort of slightly uncanny. Really love this painting, Shelley. What did? You, uh, I tried not to look at the picture too much. I tried to let loose. I think when we were painting this painting, we were trying to, to, to really embrace her style, which is very loose and kind of quick, impressionist kind of approach. Really think this turned out really effective. I think this is a great learning experience for you, Shelley. Um, I just, I really like these subtle shifts of values, these grays and blues and greens and purples really nice that is did a great job that's that's acrylic acrylic on paper maybe and there's sandra's wow so i think this looks a lot more like mine because i tend to have very bright colors anyway <laughs> so that it's very very different here than than shelly's which is much more subdued right this one's probably i think most of everyone kind of use the very bright palette that i typically use my, myself really cool Really nice. Um, I think, and I can't quite remember, but I do feel like the the they kind of curve around, like as if this is, you know, a um, a trench that goes around the corner, or I guess goes this way for you guys, right? Um, and right now, this sort of looks more just like a bowl shape, whereas I think the trench continues around the corner. Um, minor detail, but I think just darkening that value would might be helpful. Like, uh, oh wow, that's cool, Maria. Do you think the bridge is too high? Can I change anything else? Uh, I can't quite remember. You know, I I don't know if this is a bridge so much as in those trenches because they would flood all the time. There were they would just put these sort of wooden. You know, like pallets, you know, when you get, you know, they deliver things to uh, uh, the grocery store or Home Depot, things come on those wooden pallets. Basically, sort of like that. You can imagine pallets just on the ground in the trenches just to give a little, to, to, to raise the, the, so that water could kind of flood underneath it. And when soldiers were walking around, they wouldn't constantly be getting their boots wet which were certainly not as weatherproof as anything close to what we can buy at the department store today. Anyway, um, so I don't know how much of a bridge it is, and maybe there was a puddle that would have been underneath there. I, I can't quite. So, is it too high? I, I don't know, and I can't quite remember the way that Mary Ritter Hamilton painted it. I don't mind it the way it is right now. Uh, I think her version was still was a little bit ambiguous as to what was going on down here, so I don't. It doesn't bother me so much the way that you've painted or anyone else has, has done it. Wow, I like that a lot, Heidi. That is really nice. Really, it's got a kind of a Renoirish kind of quality with the way that this very soft, dry, brushy kind of quality in here. That is really nice. I, I, this is very surprising, Heidi. I really like the way that this one's executed. You know, these kind of very delicate brush strokes, and then there's looks like some maybe white glaze or just white um, and gray delicately brushed over top of that. That's really nice. I really like the way you did this. Uh, I think it's better than the one I did for sure. And Eleanor, I had a real struggle with this one, and it was not my favorite, but I did it anyway, and I learned a lot from it, which is why I painted it. Awesome, that's great, that's what I love to hear. That's, that's what every experience of painting should be, is that if you learn something from it, it doesn't really matter what it looks like. I mean, ideally, by the end, you can feel really excited and proud of it, but 
sometimes the final results aren't exactly what we expect them to be and um that's okay in fact that's probably that's one of the reasons why i paint is because I like not knowing exactly what the final result is, and I like being surprised. Sometimes I'm very disappointed, um, including, you know, the Zelensky painting I did the other day is kind of eats at me, and I think I might do another version or continue working on it. Um, and it's a good, it, for me, it's just a good reminder that, you know, not every painting that I make or, or that everyone else makes is going to be a good painting. Right. You can't expect them to always be great, but uh, um, anyway, I'm not sh Oh, yes, I actually think this turned out pretty good. I do think maybe there's some kind of clarification we could do down here in the this area that, that I think I think all of us probably had a little bit of questions exactly what was going on down here. And perhaps while we were painting it, we could have done things there to clarify that. Um, but it certainly would have made it a little bit different than what Mary Ritter Hamilton saw and did. Anyway, I also like the way this is painted. I especially like some of these marks inside. Like, that really feels to me more like a, a pathway. It's pretty well developed in there. Very cool. And then let's just, before we move on, here here's a few other paintings that you guys did that are also Remembrance Day themed, obviously not the, the, the painting that we did, but I'm always excited, whatever anyone's doing, if they're painting along with me and, and uploading them to the group, that, I mean, that's exciting. <laughs> it's sort of like we're sharing a studio and making paintings together. Um, so let's see, Dolores, I think this turned out great. You know, I really like the, there's a, a great looseness to the way that this is painted and in some of the other paintings that you've done. And I think it's pretty bold to make paint, to use like watercolor in this way. And then when you're outlining it to, to allow these like little gaps in between. And we have like, like paint that goes over the lines or doesn't go up to the lines. That gives it like a real, um, it gives it this sense of urgency and uh, spontaneity and uh, also it feels like you're I think it, it, it tells the viewer that you're very open to uh, to like embracing maybe like the imperfections in art and in life in general like I, I think I think that, you know, that, that is really difficult to allow yourself to do. I know that if, you know, some other people would really struggle, you know, if there was some of this would come, you know, go outside the lines or whatever, would could get quite upset with themselves. So I really appreciate that. I, I think that's, that turned out really great. Even the background, you know, some of this feels a little bit like, um, a little scribbly, a little bit like a, a bit of an afterthought, but you know, some of these lines, I don't mind them so much. I think maybe, I mean, it again, it does feel very spontaneous. It reminds me a lot of, again, we've, we've looked at a number of uh, Chinese artists that, that would have done similar things, maybe not quite as scribbly down here, but, um, that same sort of looseness of painting is sort of like a, a hallmark of Chinese art uh, of a certain period, right? Maybe less so today, but I think that, that turned out really cool. Wow, and Susan, al almost the exact opposites or, or very similar here, except there's no outlines, right? And again, this also reminds me a lot of of like a, how a Chinese calligrapher might have painted this type of image. Wow, that is really cool. Both of the, very interesting, it's almost like a great side-by-side -side to think of the difference between what an outline can do and what a, a painting can look like without outline. Like I could see you outlining this exactly the way Dolores did. And I, and I would say, Dolores, you could see what would happen if you didn't outline it. Um, 
Very wild. These are, and both of them are done with watercolor, which somehow seems very appropriate for um, Remembrance Day. I don't know what it is about about that, but uh, huh. So let's move on here. Uh, we're going at a good pace, so. We'll look here at Anish Kapoor. Only one person did uh, a painting for when we looked at Anish Kapoor, and that's Paula. And uh, we're just oh, yeah. this is the the if you recall, this is <laughs> I did two paintings for that episode. This is the one I did in three dimensions, and I did another one that was also just paint with a, maybe a little bit of matte medium in there. I really liked how this turned out. It's so weird and strange, and the original is big and weird and strange. Um, and it also looks like, Paula, you've glued paper. I think that's cut paper onto here. So that's also really nice. I didn't even notice that until just now. You can see that texture of so, I again, I really applaud that you experimented with your materials like that. That is wild. I think there's a lot of potential for you to do more of this kind of work. And it may or may not be something that, a style that appeals to you much. Um, but even at the very least, incorporating these mixed media elements, which is what we call when we, when we have multiple... Uh, different materials in an artwork we call that mixed media because you're mixing different medias into a painting or sculpture so um, I could see you really playing more with this type of technique even if you want to make something that looks realistic quote unquote I think using um, other materials whether gluing in them or painting with them would be uh, very effective. So let me just see. Okay, let's progress to another artist here. So we're going to take a look at all of the great art that you guys did in re kind of response to the, the classes that we've done. And then in about another 20 minutes we're going to take a look at the artwork that you guys have done on your own I should have mentioned that at the beginning but probably most of you watching are, are familiar with, with the structure of these feedback episodes so here's Maria's painting Heidi's painting and Paula's painting wow I, I, I'm a huge fan of Yuping and these are uh this this painting is it is a little bit different than I than probably many of his other works. Many of his other works are, have a lot of detail, and they're also kind of quite uniquely shaped. A lot of them are, are kind of long or wide, or or big, and are almost like Where's Waldo with just tons of detail. So I I chose this painting because I felt like it was something that would be a little bit more. Um, accessible and easier for us to to, to uh, recreate a great job Maria <laughs> I tried to follow the rules of time because I, I noticed there's a black paint on the top of the painting but I did not use it I mixed my own <laughs> that's that's good because you know the paint police you know they are very serious about those types of infractions so <laughs> <laughs> that's great um, that turned out really cool I wonder is that your signature I wonder what what that little sneaky little bit of words are in there um, you know another thing I really like this painting because of how uh, you Peng was just very loose with the application of paint again just like Matisse allowing gaps in between and we've again we've just we've been looking at that from a few different artists here you know with those <clears throat> um, poppies from the previous artworks the Rem Remembrance Day ones it's really hard to allow yourself 
to 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 not cover every inch of the canvas with paint. I think that turned out really nice. Wow, Heidi, same sort of thing. I actually really love the way you did her clothing here. This robe and these kind of greens and blues. All those layers upon layers of color just create such a wonderful complexity in that painting. I love it. Um, let's turn that off. Uh, yeah, that is wild. That is really successful. Uh, I really enjoyed the loose freedom, and I love those cute animals. That is cool. That's that. That's a really great job, Heidi. I really appreciate that one. That's really well done. And Paula, that's great too. It does have a little bit more of an orangey quality. I could just be the photograph. I don't mind it being more orange. The only thing is that it probably by pushing it to the red, we're just going to amplify the contrast, right? Because red and green are almost completely opposite from one another on the color wheel, which is how we're going to... those. Whenever we have exact complementary colors... Right, um, I'll just turn that camera off, right? So, complementary colors, when we have colors that are opposite from one another on the color wheel, we have, like, it's, it's basically the same as putting black and white side by side, right? Super high contrast. So, you know, red is the opposite of green, just like yellow is the opposite of purple, right? Or blue is the opposite of orange, etc. And those kind of contrasts are, are usually very satisfying uh, color combinations, which is why we often see th those combinations in sports teams, uh, uniform logos and colors, etc. Uh, because they tend to go with one another really well. Uh, but I don't mind it so much. I just think it's just interesting to see the difference uh, in in this painting in particular, right? Because there's a lot of green, and we put green in, in her outfit. Um, but, but yeah, great job. I Again, oh, let me see. Maria also included... Oh, I think this is because this is the original and wanted us to see up close that this was actually not black, but there's detail in there. Cool. I think still we could have had a little, I think maybe this, because I do see some green elements. I, it's almost like you, you pushed it a little bit too dark, right? I think doing sort of what we have here with Heidi and Paula, um, but that's just a, a good reminder of how quickly your dark color can dominate or even just like white obliterate what's there. I don't, you could, you could try painting other colors back over top of it. Uh, I don't know how effective that would be though. Cause you almost have to like paint those colors back and then darken them again. And because you have a darker foundational layer, you're not gonna quite have the, the same sort of effect of those colors kind of coming through unless you were to let's say paint like a yellow and a green that had a little bit of white in them to kind of brighten them or lighten them up a little bit and then darken over top. But I, again, I just, just sort of explaining how we could um, uh, get closer to the original if that's something that is interesting to for you. Wow, there's so many comments in the chat here. Just before I move on, I just want to quickly... Oh, there's Pascal there, Napoleon. <laughs> je suis non français, je suis américain, j'aime parler français. Oui, oui, c'est bien, Napoleon. Um, Pascal. <laughs> uh, it's talking in French as well, Laurie. Hi, everyone. Excited to see everyone's work and hear Michael's critiques. There's Rachel and Robin. Awesome, Heidi there. Yeah, I'm going back to the sunflowers, a layer of paper, yes. The, uh, 
Um, Paula's here. Paula, and the point says, how do I send a painting to you? Uh, join the Facebook group. Upload your artwork directly to the Facebook group. That's how that's how you can do it, and that way we can include them in the next episodes. That'd be great. And thank you, Pascal, for explaining that uh, ten minutes ago before I got to it just now. I appreciate that. Um, Deborah's there. <laughs> and Paul says, "I love you guys." Heidi says, thank you, Michael. I have not done as much as I would like to do this period. I did draw for the majority of my paintings, though. Slow, frustrating sometimes, and not good looking. <laughs> and uh, Heidi hasn't been watching much television lately. That is good. Oh, because Paul's saying, nice painting, Heidi. Better to listen to, the, to these reviews than the news. Yes, absolutely, yes. Ugh. Yes, don't get me started <laughs> about the news these days. Not a lot of good news in the world these days, but I'm quite confident there'll be good news as it, going forward. So um, it's uh, despite everything, things will always get better. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at a different artist. This is Sang Yu. Um, and uh, this is one of my favorite artists that we've explored. Again, really, th this, this quite loose style that he used, uh, especially he painted a lot of flowers, a lot of animals. So if you're interested in, you want to explore the art of a, another artist, uh, especially because I know a, a number of you like painting animals, saying you, if you haven't looked at that episode, I strongly encourage you to kind of go back. This is one of my favorite, this little cat sipping water out of a uh, plate or a bowl. That turned out really good, Heidi. Uh, this one's in the... Uh, yeah, we did paint... We painted this one, right? Yes. Because I think sometimes <laughs> I include a few other images in the Dropbox folder and I forget which one we've done. Because um, we've done 200, 200 painting episodes and probably 250 paintings in total. So I don't know how that happened. How uh, Time just has been flying, hey? So that was Heidi's. Here's Paula's. I love that Paula combined the flowers and then put the cat in behind. That is so awesome, Paula. And it actually looks really good, too. You really did a fantastic job. In fact, let's just look at all of the other paint saying you paintings and then we'll kind of examine them all together. Wow. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> These are great. Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. Susan painted this in real time. That is incredible. And Sandy, I can't remember, was this one a video? This might have been a video documentation, like a time lapse. A few people have done that recently on the group. Wow. My favorite styles are the loose ones. Which I think a lot of people feel that way. Like they like the, the style that's kind of loose because it's maybe a little bit easier, faster, there's more freedom, less sort of fiddling maybe. Kind of maybe at the end a greater sense of satisfaction accomplishment maybe keep it a little zoomed out um so how about we start here with paula's i think you did a really great job here paula i think the flowers turned out fantastic a lot of little detail i think we could have even tried to get even smaller detail in in some of these flowers but you know it's not that big of a deal I love that not only did you do the cat here, but we see that the cat kind of is on the other side of the glass, and we see a little bit of the cat here. Sometimes you, some, I see that kind of thing, and there might be just an empty space there, and then be like, oh, I for forgot that the cat should be visible there, right? And so that little bit of attention to detail is effective. I would say that you know we have this shadow that's underneath this cat that does not appear here, right? So little tiny detail, but I think that 
you know, it's one of those kind of things that might cause somebody to think, why is there something, what is missing here? Not, not again, not that big of a detail, but that could be added. I would also consider adding a little bit of a little white wash over the, these sides because that glass is going to kind of diffuse the light a little bit and soften the light. And so we would expect it to be, oops, a little bit le like, for instance, right here, as I just accidentally jumped down, like see how inside the glass is a slightly different color than the outside of the glass? Because that's going to tell us that that's a vase that's made of glass and not, I don't know, um, a shape made of pipe cleaners or wire that is totally transparent that you could put your hand through. Um, and that these are like maybe dried flowers and they're just sitting on the table and there's no water or anything here, right? So I think Dolores did a fantastic job here. Uh, really great. That was really cool. Yeah, I love... You know, it was fun doing this painting too because we used a different color for the Imprimatur. I think we used... It was like a cool red or a warm red. I, I'm trying to remember what we did for this one. Um, but it, it just was a good reminder that there's lots of different ways that we can start a painting. It doesn't always have to begin with either a white canvas or the warm yellow that I typically use, or even, you know, a rusty red or a brown that so many artists have used over the centuries that you could do, like saying you did to paint a a red or a green or an orange or a purple or something like we did a couple Picasso paintings I think at least one where we put a purple imprimatur down right so you know I, I think that's one of the things that we can get from these artists is, is just recognizing there's so many different possibilities and I think there's some kind of there's positives and negatives to that just because sometimes when we see so many different possibilities it's like oh I don't even know where to begin, which is why you can always fall back to putting that warm yellow down or a brown, uh, because those are probably the easiest and most typical um, approaches, or even just a plain white if you just want to stay with with the, probably the most common thing that we see today. But I think that was that was kind of fun experimenting with, it. and it does give us a particular effect. Like here, Kathy, you've done a, also a great job. Is what's interesting is it's almost like we painted kind of like the 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 leaves or the branches and the flowers first, or at least we did the the you know before we did I think some of the these white detailing over top of it, and then we painted the background this yellow over top and around, um, which which creates a, a really interesting look to these flowers uh, and then the leaves and branches that is is one of the things I think is just so beautiful about saying use art is is that way of of painting the background last or at least one of the final layers and outlining everything which is which is um, less typical than than 90 percent of artists even to this day certainly at at the time um, and again, just for reminding, oh, there's lots of different ways that one can make a painting. That's really good, great to know. I love these, the way the colors look. Great job. Here's Eleanor's. Great, same thing. You know, I love just seeing that little bit of kind of pink color kind of showing through. I don't know how much I can add to this. I haven't just said already with everyone else's work really like these kind of this blue with a little bit of that darker black in there and uh, you guys saying you would be very proud to see all of these incredible reinterpretations of his work here I'm sure that just makes me so excited um, really great Maria that is so cool yeah I, I mean I, I, there, I had a really hard time choosing which images to, to do when we focused on this artist. So I, I, I would, 
he's on my list. Of, I actually have done more sketches of other paintings. There are a couple more of the flowers that I'd like to do. Once I kind of finish all the other artists that I want to do, I want to circle back and start going back through some of the Dropbox folders and painting some of the paintings we haven't done. And not everything is in the Dropbox because I was like, ah, there's... I want to save some for a future bonus episode here and there. Uh, this is great Sandy. I think I remember watching... I watched this the, the sort of time lapse you did here. And that was really cool. You know, that, that's something that all of you can do. You know... Um, you could easily set up uh, a tripod with like your phone and most newer smartphones have in the camera have a time-lapse feature and you could set that up just like I mean I have a little bit more of a, uh, uh, an advanced setup here but you could film and then upload your version of your time-lapse of the painting you create to our Facebook group or put them on YouTube Hey, why not? Especially, you know, you could do that with the paintings we do, but especially the ones that you're creating on your own and uh, inspired by other people's art or things that you're interested in that are totally unique creations of your own. Especially those of you that are, are really progressing quite far and are thinking about selling your work or who are already selling your work, that's a great way of, of, of capturing people's attention and, and bringing your attention back to your... Etsy site or eBay site or wherever your, your website, wherever you're selling your work. Um, and then Susan here. Again, I like this little bit of pink outlines here. I really, this is just such a great painting for us to study from and, and also what you've done here, Susan. And I like that you painted this in real time while we were doing it. That's that uh, is is also a sign that you're getting better and better and better that you can kind of keep up and execute it in real time. That's very cool. So let's keep on going here. How are we doing for time? Okay. So we'll we're gonna look at one, two, three, four, five more artists, and then we're gonna take a look at the artwork that you guys have done. Okay, so here is, we've got two paintings that you guys did. This is for uh, Thanksgiving, I think. Was this American Thanksgiving we did this painting? Uh, Henry Tanner, or Henry Asawa Tanner. Um, and uh, I, this is such an awesome, powerful painting. And I'm really excited that uh, it would be nice to see more people attempt this painting, but there's certainly going to be lots more Thanksgivings in the future. And um, so here's Paula's version of it. It's interesting, Paula sort of almost changed the angle and kind of moved us a little bit more towards like the, it's like the the artist took a couple extra steps to the left in the view to execute that. Really cool. I like that. Uh, maybe a lot more yellow in in than in the original, and I think we could just probably add a little bit of white to just um, tint it down a little bit. And then here is Maria's. Wow, that turned out awesome. Wow, Maria, are you kidding me? That is great. I also really, I, I mean, I love everything about this painting. The background, you did a better job than I did for sure. And the table, that is awesome. I love, I mean, there were, some, there were more details on here. There was like, I think some knives and butter and it, it definitely made things more complex. And I love that you made some very creative decisions just to eliminate a few details that you might have felt were like either unnecessary or might have been causing you troubles. <clears throat> Especially because this painting is probably a third of the size of the original. So you just sort of made it more manageable. You just sort of took off the bites that you could 
and I think it turned out really effective. This is a really, really great job here. Wow. Great work, Maria. Wow. Let me know if you missed something. If I missed something major, I don't think... I think you nailed it. That's great. Wow. I'm just going to turn this whole operation over to you guys and let you guys do all this. You guys are uh, are outdoing me. That's correct. Which is, for a teacher, that's exactly what you want. You want the the, the people that are, you're, you're helping, you want them to eventually exceed you. Or any, any most teachers, I think that's what you should want of yourself and, and your students, but um, that's okay. So now we're going to be looking at Louis Wayne, uh, the, the the great British artist who, who originally, like Paul is here, painted lots of cats. He was known as like the cat artist. And then towards the end of his life started making these much more abstract paintings. And... We had a, a kind of interest while we were talking about during that episode of whether they were the product of an artist who was exploring abstraction or someone who was suffering from some sort of um, mental challenges, uh, potentially schizophrenia and that kind of thing. But some of the more recent research has suggested that he might not have been crazy after all I mean he was, he was certainly suffering from probably some type of medical condition but whether it was actually affecting his brain um, is, is something that because you know in pre preparing this episode doing a lot of research most of the, the doctors who sort of looked at these say if you were like undergoing like schizophrenic episodes you just don't have the dexterity and capacity to make a painting of this level of detail. So the kind of story, the narrative that has been, the the, the we've come to understand about this artist might might not be as accurate as um, as we've been led to believe. But anyway, so here's Eleanor's. Well, like maybe let's go back to Paula's version of the of this one here. <laughs> I love this painting, and I love what you've done here, Paula. I love the big eyes of this cat, which I'm pretty sure, I mean, that's kind of what we did, and the birds kind of sitting around listening uh, to the beautiful music. It turned out really good. I, I also, there's a lot of little details in the grass. Um, again, a kind of deceptively complex image. Anytime you have lots of grass and leaves, those tend to be maybe not super complex, just time-consuming to get all of that detail uh, on there. Oops. Um, so then there, here's Paula's version of the more abstract image that we did the day after, I think. we did Because we did two episodes on this. I can only follow 50%. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely... There's so much detail in this image that trying to do it in real time is was pretty tricky. So I acknowledge that that was one of the more complex ones. Some people really liked it. Some people were like, I'm not even going to bother trying it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, again, in all fairness too, Paul, like the fact that you are not using the templates and you sketched this out and it's... An, it's a very symmetrical image makes it really hard would have made your job 10 times more difficult than me working from the template right or Eleanor here but great that looks awesome wow that must have taken some serious time Eleanor wow you, you can see Eleanor I really enjoyed painting this one I can so for, that's I'm one of the reasons why I try to choose as many different types of artists from as many different backgrounds and religions and cultures, etc. Because, and, and obviously styles, because I think being able to spend a little bit of time in different um, people's shoes, I, I, mean, I think that's just, I, 
one thing that would help alleviate some of the difficulties in the world if we spend a little more time trying to understand one another instead of telling ever telling everyone how stupid they are and how they should think a lot more like us but i mean just in terms of of art that the more that um we explore different styles it helps us identify which style we might be most um that we can express ourselves with most naturally and efficiently and effortlessly as possible um i think it's either rambo or baudelaire uh both of whom are French poets, who said the goal of an artist should be to, or the goal of really all artists is to be able to express themselves as effortlessly as the healthy person digests food. Right now, it's always like, oh, that is really interesting. Yeah, that you want to be able, just like you don't think about, you know, okay, I'm going to drink this, sip this tea. And now I'm going to tell my body, okay, squeeze these muscles to get that that fluid down into my belly. Okay, now let's pour in these three juices to, to digest that and push it down through my kidneys. We don't think about all those kind of things. And when it comes to making art, wouldn't it be great if instead of trying to think like, oh, man, how are we going to do this? You just start doing it without thinking, just like you don't think about how to digest stuff. And so the more that we explore those different techniques, the more we kind of start zeroing in on that one thing that becomes more effortless, right? Okay, let's continue on here. We'll look at the, the art here, Frank Miller and Klaus Janssen, who did Daredevil. This is for Daredevil Day. I think this is also Cyber Monday, it might have been. We did this. Um, see what, so just two paintings here. There's Paula, who's always painting along with me every class, uploading their work, so I always appreciate that, Paula. There's your Daredevil, and then here's Vanya's Daredevil. Very cool. Awesome. Again, I, I might have taken longer on this painting than then uh, I would have, you know, I, I guess sometimes you have to do that first version of a painting and then you figure out what works and what doesn't. And then if you do it a second time, you're almost inevitably guaranteed that it's going to be better the second time, right? Which is why I think if you're working on a painting and you maybe want to make a large painting of a friend of yours or of your pet or your friend's pet, it would probably be, even though it might take you, at least mentally you think it might take you longer to do a, a smaller version of it on like a nine by 12 canvas or eight by 10 canvas board, work out the composition and the colors and then do that and if you can execute it on that size then the, the likelihood that it's going to look great when it gets bigger is is much much higher than if you just begin on that big canvas and you're trying to figure it out for the first time that poses a lot more challenges and so i think about that all the time that's the way that i typically work on my own paintings i do smaller paintings and then I'll kind of, then I've got maybe 10 smaller paintings, which I can also sell. <laughs> and then I can see like, oh, here's, I wanted, to, I've got maybe a few larger canvases that I've built and stretched and prepped and they're all ready to go. Which of these 10, which are, which are the two ones that I want to enlarge, right? And now I've got, you know, I can be like, yes. Okay. So if I've done 10 of them, if I've got five or six of them that I really like, that's great odds, right? Then if I, maybe my two favorite, which might not necessarily be the two that I think would scale up best, but maybe then I can take those two and, and that way I'll have way more confidence than when I paint those big ones that they're gonna turn out the way I like. And I'm not, because you know, a larger painting takes longer to make and it's easier to kind of go into it having some confidence that you of knowing what you you need to do to make it successful than doing it for the first time and then if you're having to repaint things move things around it's no fun um these are great <laughs> i love this that's great paula 
He really looks like he's jumping right at us here. Whereas here in Vanya's, it looks sort of like Daredevil's gonna sort of jump, just sort of just pass us. <laughs> he's coming right for us here. I love it. Okay. Let's keep on going. We're gonna look at two more artists here and then we'll move on to looking at your art. So here is the, we're looking at Jean-Michel Basquiat, the uh, incredible American artist from the 80s. And we did two paintings of his, so this is uh, the one that was done on paper. And then we did another one. So here actually Paulo's got them two side by side. Maybe we'll, let's look at them all together. This is the other painting that Joshua did. And then we also have a few different interpretations and in, in other Basquiat paintings that were done as well. So let's kind of go back up here with Joshua. That turned out great, Josh. That's, that, I really like how you executed this a lot. I, you know, one of the things, Joshua, is you've done so, I really love how many artworks that you've done and really explored so many different styles. And I, and I've, I see kind of some of them are you've, you've certainly spent a lot more time and a lot more patience developing some of the more complex images and then it seems like there's another side of you that really likes doing much more spontaneous artworks and I think these turned out really strong and you may want to think of really because some because I have seen you try to do some of the more complex images that require a lot more patience in a, in a much looser style. And sometimes those turn out really well, but they're not, it's it's much harder to do that type of a painting in a loose way and for it to, to be successful. So it may, maybe we're thinking about doing your own paintings in a very loose style like that. I'm not sure which one you, which kind of style you prefer more. They're just two different ways of working, but. Uh, uh, these are cool too, Paula. I think you did a great job uh, on both of these. I love how you kind of let these splatters and drips and things. It's a little blurry photograph, but I think we can we kind of get it. <laughs> wow, I love that face, and that one turned out really great. Great job. <laughs> It's a great fun for us big kids. I appreciate that. That's the way it should be, right? I think painting is is gives us adults a, a permission to play. And here's Joshua's version of the other one that we did. And this one was also fun too because, if you recall, I was allowing paint to drip, and I got some pretty wild drips, which I think Paula is what she captured in this here. <laughs> Um, yeah, again, I think these this is a could be a really interesting direction for you to go in, Joshua, and really kind of explore this a lot. Wow, Lorenzo, that is awesome. You really nailed this painting. That's great job, Lorenzo. I would love to see you maybe experiment a little bit more with Jean-Michel Basquiat's style. Or take his style and incorporating it into your own. I don't know, you did, this is really effective. And I love that you also did another one of his and it turned out pretty well. Uh, and this looks like you've got maybe acrylic and pastel, is that oil pastel? And maybe some Sharpie there. I, if this is indeed Sharpie, and I'm pretty sure it is, you may wanna consider using um, one of those Posca pens that, that I often use. Um, which which aren't really it might be twice as expensive as a sharpie. You know, a sharpie might cost what a dollar, two dollars, uh, at an office supply store. A Posca pen is maybe like five or six dollars, but I think you might actually really really enjoy working at least for maybe doing some writing and small details. It makes your life a lot easier, and it's also gonna look great now as well as. 20 years from now, whereas this Sharpie is going to 
not age pretty well. It's probably going to turn green or purple over the next few years. Even if you keep it in a dark room, Sharpie is just not intended to last that long. And then I love this Maria here. I think Maria was trying to do this painting. It looks like that anyway. And I think that's what she said here. It started up as started off as Jean-Michel and ended up here. Because <laughs> we can see kind of the outline of the head here. But, you know, I think that's really cool. I, I absolutely applaud you for, rather than just giving up on the painting and tossing it away, is instead going, yeah, this it's not working the way I want, so what can I do with it? What, what kind of... How could I transform this into something different? And then you painted this face and turned it into kind of like a... Egyptian or Roman Greek kind of figure here with this robe and this uh, what do they call that uh, crown like a like it's like Caesar and the Roman emperors used to wear those kind of things uh, um, and then th these very dramatic outlining of these black radiating lines are pretty intense but certainly you know is eye-catching you know if you this was on exhibit in in a gallery with a lot of other paintings it would be very hard to ignore it because these incredible contrasts between the light blue and the black as I keep saying those contrasts are they pull our eyes towards it right it's very hard to ignore big contrasts okay so we'll look at our last um, artist here before we look at your artwork that you guys have been creating on your own time and or maybe during class time as well. <laughs> uh, so here's uh, Georges Seurat or Soro, and uh, let's take a look at these together. Uh, whoa. <laughs> oh, these are great. Well, you guys. Huh. Wow. Um, where should we, should we go start here with Paula here? Uh, so, wow. That's great, Paula. I love the amount of paint that you've layered up on here. We have all of these purples and blues and pinks and everything that turned out really good I mean obviously there's a lot of time involved in doing something like that but it turned out really effective and you know it's it's maybe a little like pointillism you know is, is literally little dots and it, it actually kind of quite obviously for many of you who did this quite a time consuming process here we have a little bit more there's a little bit less of a dot and maybe a little bit more uh, slightly longer brush strokes that, that has a bit more of an impressionist kind of quality like Monet or Pissarro uh, which makes it slightly different than pointillism and what the this artist was doing I don't doesn't bother me at all uh, in fact, I actually think there's maybe a lot of potential here for you, especially the way that you've built up some... There's some areas that I think are particularly effective. Really good. Really good. In May, uh, who's been painting with us since the very beginning, and hasn't, I guess, probably been quite busy lately, uh, so it was kind of, it's nice to see one of her paintings included here and just sort of checking in every once in a while, which is, that makes me really happy. Uh, and it's great that this is one of the paintings you chose to do. What a beautiful job. Wow, really a lot of work. Turn out really, and also the border, I think, turned out really nice. Really, really nice job here, May. You really feel that the texture in certain areas where you've really layered up Wow, great job, really great job, May. And then Leslie, here, let's see. Oh no, this is Eleanor, isn't it? 
I think I might have mislabeled it here. Um, oh, great. And it looks interesting how different it is without that dark border around. Right? Um, where we have just the white. I mean, you could also do a kind of a border that isn't dark but is but even lighter right not that you you need to but it, it does quite radically affect the the way that we what we see inside because you know this border that he included in his original does make it it almost makes it look like we're looking through a window and that's like the the frame of the window that we're seeing things through versus kind of just being out there in the world and seeing it, right? You know, just walking down a pathway. Um, wow, really nice. Very much more subtle use of color. You know, these, the, the variations between all of these colors are, are, are much more nuanced um, than even he did. Right, a big part of pointillism is using very contrasting colors, even in the sky. Um, so I, uh, I applaud kind of your restraint in this in this area here. Uh, turn out great. And here's Laurie. Wow. I think I think when I was putting these together, reading something like I'm just done. I'm sick of doing dots. <laughs> uh, that's great, but this is fantastic. Wow. That is exciting. I also think, you know, it, if you... This is a, you know, pointillism... Well, I was going to say is a kind of a technique that if you're willing to put the time into it, is kind of hard to screw up. Like, it um, is... I think it's a very forgiving technique if you're willing to put time into it because there's something about all those little dots that just immediately convey time right we it's hard for anyone what no matter how they feel about art or modern art or whatever to, to dismiss it they're at the very least they just be like wow that's a lot of time and work involved because i can imagine all those little dots take time um and because everything's kind of a little bit fuzzy you sort of immediately know that the that you understand that detail is not a primary concern it's more about the color um so i think it's it's i i mean just my probably some of you who painted this painting would disagree but i think um uh, that it might be something that maybe is more accessible for a beginner artist to do even though it takes more time Wow, tons of comments here. Maybe before I move on. So read some comments. Elmer says, Maria, I love the Thanksgiving painting you did, the Henry Oswat Tanner painting. Lolly says, wow, you you guys blow my mind all the time. I can't stop myself from smiling to be a part of such a wonderful group of people. I agree. That's what I think about all the time. It's so um, rewarding for me to, <laughs> to be a part of this group and to see things like this, you know, coming in every day, every few hours onto that Facebook group. It's such, like, a great reminder of, like, the the human spirit and the creativity and especially those of you who, who are fairly new to painting and to see people just jumping in both feet into into this new skill that's just like that's more than any teacher could ever hope to, to see so thank you all everyone for your devotion to constantly making more and more work and pushing yourselves and I know it's like it's interesting. Like some people kind of coming and going and coming and back again, and um, you know everyone needs to take a break every once in a while. But I also love when when people sort of take a break and come back and show us a little bit of something here and there and carve a little bit of free time out 
of your schedule. Um... <laughs> Lolly says, I was arrested for my pointillism. The paint police came over and they had to destroy it. It was that bad. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. Pascal says, did anyone try a Pissarro? Some are like between Impressionism and Pointillism. Yep, that would be one thing I would love to do one day is to do a, a couple episodes on Pissarro. He's also one of the one of the, the great uh, Impressionist painters. So, let's move on to looking at all the artwork that you guys have been up to. So we'll go through this in kind of alphabetical order, and then I've got a few that I've reserved to the very end um, that I want to kind of show just to, to kind of wrap things up. So you might be like, oh, I, I did submit more than those. Where did those go? Well, I, I mean, hopefully they're at the end. It's entirely possible that I, I goofed, but uh, we'll see here. Um, so let's just uh, start right here. In fact, I'm I've got some fresh tea versus an older tea. So, nice, fresh um, cream of Earl Grey. If you haven't tried that, it blows you, it will blow your mind. Okay. So here's Kathy. Kathy, relatively new to the group. This Picasso painting, awesome. Right, this, I, this is one of the paintings, I think, I can't remember if we did all cool blue over the entire background as an imprimatura, or we did cool blue and maybe purple, or maybe we did a yellow and then we put blue and purple. I can't remember, but either way, it was a kind of a, again, we talked about how Picasso was deliberately using an unconventional painting process uh, because his father had taught him a very traditional way of working and Picasso being at this time, like 20 years old, 22 or something, which is very depressing him being that good that early, but um, him just being like any other 20 year old wanting to, to just do exactly the opposite <laughs> of their teachers or father in this instance, right? So it was just, again, a great lesson for all of us. And this is a very effective job, Kathy. This is great, great work. Let's look at here, Deborah's version here. This is Rick and Gracie at Mackenzie King Estates. There's a, like a ruin here that they're kind of in the center of. This is also a great um, image. You know, this idea of putting people inside of a window or next to a window or sitting in a window or a door frame or, which is very true, you know, it's, um, you see this a lot in photography, especially these days because it gives a natural frame, right? So that's something to kind of think about when you're composing in images. To, like, even if you're doing a landscape, often if you look at landscape paintings by many favorite famous artists, you might notice that there's like maybe two big trees on either side that kind of, and then the pathway goes in between those because it kind of, it, it's, it's like, uh, you know, columns that we can go, It's it, it kind of invites us to go into that space, right? So uh, just something to think about when you're, when you're creating a painting is, is there a way that I can create this sort of, sometimes a symmetry that, uh, that, that helps establish a space within that space? Great work, I, I love the way that they're painted. Um, one thing I would say, maybe a little bit of shadow on one side of the nose might be effective. I mean, it is snowy, so there's probably a lot of reflected light, but maybe probably underneath on this side, on that, the, the this, I guess, bottom side of the nose, we get a little bit darker. Um, 
and then maybe a little bit of the brickwork could be elaborated a little bit on this side. It's nitpicky, but uh, I also know you do such incredible work here, Deborah, that it's probably not out of your range of ability. Um, that tree branch also kind of looks a little bit like it's a a um, like moose horns or something, right? The way that it seems to be sort of not really connecting to the tree, but more so to his hat. Um, I don't... How would you... F it might be just removing or painting part of that branch out so that it's not doesn't appear to connect with his head. Again, tiny little details. But just... I, want, I just sort of want you to hear sort of maybe what I'm thinking about when I'm looking at someone's artwork, or even my own artwork. So I think we talked about this the previous episode when we were looking at all the artwork that people did inspired by Picasso and the old guitarist. And here Deborah painted herself holding the guitar. And I was saying like how cool it is, how youthful this, uh, what, what I thought was a little child, a little girl playing guitar. And then Deborah said, this is what it's based on. It's me. And I, you know, I think this is great. I, first of all, again, I love that you made a painting of yourself assuming that same position. I also think it's totally fine to, I do think you look really, really youthful in here. You, I maybe, it might be that the head is maybe a little bit larger than the body. And when children have heads that are disproportionately larger than the rest of their body, like especially babies, and we I've talked about this in my intro drawing course, which is free and you can watch here on YouTube right after this if you want. You, I did a whole episode on drawing children and the proportions of, of different people, like adults to children. And if you're drawing, let's say, a baby, you might draw them, you know, like three heads high, like the head and the the, the rest of the body is equivalent to one head size versus like me, if you're if I was trying to draw myself, I might ha be like six and a half, seven heads tall, right? So rather than, you know, two, three of my heads takes me down here. Whereas if I was drawing my daughter who's two and a half, she might be like three and a half heads. Tiny little detail, watch that episode, <laughs> learn how to draw, but uh, um, I think that might explain why you look so youthful, which is not a bad thing. Most of us want to look more youthful than we all, than we are, so I think that's really cool. But I, I appreciate. I think right after uh, we talked, you uploaded that there, so just so we could see. Here's Donna's uh, paint pouring that you did. That looks awesome, Donna. Wow, look at these cells that you created. That looks gorgeous. Great. I want to do a few episodes more paint pouring in the future. We did one, I probably, almost two years ago, probably now. It wasn't as effective as I would have liked. And since then, I've done tons of more research and gotten a few extra things to help make that more effective. So maybe we'll revisit that at a future time. But that looks really cool. And this one here is a painting, a, a Gustav Klimt that we did for, I think, Christmas two years ago. And I think Donna, I think the comment on the Facebook group is like, I did this painting two years ago, and I'm thinking I want to add a little booby, as I guess she said down here. Because in the original, it's actually part of a much larger painting in, in, in which she's completely nude. And obviously, just for our sake on YouTube, so the video wouldn't get taken down, I'd sort of just cropped it in a little bit, so we wouldn't have to even deal with that. Um, uh, so I could see you adding a little nipple down here. I would probably also just extend, I think this is either, well, I mean, it would be the armpit going down. Um, so this would certainly have to be extended down there and then we can kind of branch it off just a little bit. So we have the arm and then her breast right here and or maybe just the bottom of the nipple down here if you feel you want to include that. Um, 
The other thing is, I think we would want to think about where her chin is. So her chin should be somewhere in here, which would make, you may want to even think about bringing more of this hair down because that's going to make her, this part of her neck appear really long. And I think if we bring a bit of hair down over top of it, it will just reduce any potential awkwardness and darkening underneath here. And, you know, again, you, this is a painting you made a couple of years ago. And since then, you, all of the painting you've done, you're, you're just like light years ahead of where you were at this time. I mean... You may even want to consider just trying to start this painting over and just seeing how you would do it differently, knowing what you know now. Although I do really like it. I also really like the way you've done the child. I mean, it's almost like this part of the painting here is like is very, very successful. And then some of the rest of it needs a little bit of work, but really cool I, I really like the, the way you did that hand okay let's keep on going here Eleanor has been busy painting and framing paintings and they are amazing and I think Eleanor's selling these paintings too these are awesome Eleanor I love that I mean, I think that was something that I suggested that you do is to really explore these cactus motifs more because how successful you are at painting them. And they are absolutely gorgeous. These are incredible paintings. And I've ended the these feedback episodes, I think maybe at least once, just wrapping up looking at them because of how just, you know, I think, inspiring they are for everyone here is part of our group to see um let me just want to hide there here we go these are great eleanor really super strong works and then here's them together man i mean i think not only can you sell these as paintings as the originals but you may even want to consider scanning them at a really high quality and then making prints based on them whether they're just small like postcards or or like uh, note cards or small posters and prints because i could see them selling really well just uh, like little prints that people can take home uh so i just want to kind of go back and look at i mean this should be really inspiring for anyone who's maybe at the beginning of their art journey here, just thinking about where you can take the skills that we're developing. Not that I'm going to take credit for everything Eleanor's done. Um, I'm sure Eleanor had a little bit of practice before before she came into our community, but um, it's really exciting to see what this level of focus on one subject has done. Like that's gorgeous. Are you kidding me? These are just, like, I mean, this is another, like, Eleanor, you got to do even more of these. You got to do cactuses, and now you got to do more of these mountainscapes. That's wild. That is just true wildness. That's incredible. And then has also been doing these coasters, too. These are cool. One thing that I would say is you may want to just think about toning down your signature and this is something artists debate all the time is do you include your signature on your artwork or do you just sign the back of your artwork and and it's artists will will almost come to blows <laughs> over over that topic some artists f believe fundamentally that an artwork should not be signed on the front of the canvas and then there's certain people who will argue that absolutely a painting must be signed on the canvas. That's how people will, will get to know who you are. 
when it comes to my own artwork, there's paintings of mine that I do sign on the front. And there's times where I just look at it and I go like, I just, I don't know where I'd put it. it. It just, I don't think it would fit anywhere because your signature becomes part of the composition. And sometimes it works really well as part of the composition. And sometimes it gets in the way, you know, it, um, it almost sort of t pops us back out of the painting and makes us very aware of the artist's hand in there. And sometimes you, you maybe want that, like we see in a lot of abstract painting, it's, it's, quite uncommon to see a signature in there because often they want us to think of the painting as as a, a, a like um, a portal into another place and that we we stop thinking about ourselves our bodies and to just be immersed in color and shape and so to put a signature in there bring pulls us back out into the world of text and and language and so long story short, I would consider, it looks like maybe you're using a Posca pen. I would consider maybe getting a few different colors, maybe like a gray, a few different grays and experimenting as opposed to this black, which sits right on the, you know, like if we, again, if we think of like a window, black is like a bug on the window, right? And if you're driving your car and you get enough bugs on your window, you're like, ah, I got to pull over and clean this window because it's just getting too dirty. Sometimes like that signature sitting right on the window prevents us from seeing beyond the window. Um, and I like your signature, but I do think like if it was a little bit more subtle, I think that could also be kind of cool. And you know, you could even try even with something like this, taking a little bit more of a, like a darker gray, not this gray, but something a little bit darker and even going over top of a little bit of this almost to kind of create like this becomes like a bit of a drop shadow because you know I like all of these but even like that white like I would almost like I would probably if, I, if this was me I would consider using maybe a color that's like maybe one of these yellows in there same sort of thing and trying also maybe to incorporate it into the image so that it might kind of go around one of these rocks as opposed to just sort of being right on top of a rock in the background so it's it's because again it seems like a sticker that's right on top you know like I, again i if this was mine i would consider maybe even using let's say this blue as your signature or maybe maybe this red as opposed to the black because I think you want it, you want it to kind of mesh with the other colors that are in here. And again, I'm sure that there is, if, if you look, there's going to be another, somebody else on the internet or whatever. I've seen a lot of other teachers on YouTube who, who, who will say, not only should you put your signature, you should put a copyright symbol and the date there so no one can steal your images and reproduce them. Personally... I would strongly discourage anyone from putting the copyright symbol right on the front of their painting. That's certainly not what like uh, high end, high fine art artists do. Yeah, you know, um, it's just that's that that is I think kind of tacky to put a copyright symbol on it on the actual. In, with your as when you sign the painting technically in North America you don't even need to sign it the minute a painting is finished it's already considered to have copyright now it's a good idea to sign it at least on the back put the date on there to photograph it um, as soon as possible that helps protect you but putting a little copyright symbol is is not gonna add any more security to your painting to prevent people from stealing it or whatever. Again, here this signature being bright white, I would probably opt for just a little bit of a darker blue just to make it it kind of kind just less loud of a signature in there. I mean, again. I, I'm sure probably some of you watching right now might have a very different feeling about that, but that's just my own feelings about signatures. 
Okay, let's move on here. Here's Gemini. <laughs> I love this. This is a Cornelius Craighoff painting that we did. And it looks like Gemini also switched out the mug. Because I think it was just a plain old mug or chalice or something. It was like a little... I'm trying to remember now. What that... I think it was a little tiny like brandy cup or, you know, ice wine. Even though this painting, I'm sure, was painted... 150 years before ice wine but it was like a little tiny thing so i love this kind of mug which was probably more specific to um to you and uh i think it's great customizing paintings that that, that reflect you and your interests by all means absolutely go for it um so here let's move on to greg wow Greg is fairly new to the group. This is a painting of these power lines that is so effective from far, farther away. It looks like a photograph, right? And then as soon as we start kind of zooming in on it, we're like, oh, wow, it's actually kind of loosely painted, right? That not that, I love that kind of thing where from far away, you're like, oh, what's a snapshot? And then you kind of walk up and you're like, whoa it's just a bunch of loose brush strokes like you know some of the brush strokes in these posts it f from far away it actually quite effectively conveys the look of of like wood and then up close it kind of falls apart a little bit which is not a bad thing M most great paintings as when you approach them quote unquote fall apart into just brush strokes and i think that's really satisfying i i it's because then, it, again, it really increases that the illusion when you step back. You know, there's other philosophy, like more classical painting, is that it should be as tightly wound when you're standing across the room as when you're looking right up at it, like, like the Mona Lisa never falls apart. Some people love that. I think it's, it's an interesting concept, but I think it also can be just really overkill. Because most people just don't look at paintings that closely anymore. Maybe they did when Leonardo was alive, but most people are just not that interested, unfortunately. Or a lot of people just don't know how to look at art any these days. Anyway, great job. Very interesting composition, too. You know, this would probably be not the kind of thing most people would decide to make a painting of. So I also really applaud your attention to this aspect of our urban life that is some people would not only not make a painting of but would find kind of ugly right and i think that's one of the great things that art can do is make us take a second look at ugly things and um and when it's done like this one might then stop next time they're walking and just sort of look at the power lines and be like huh there is something kind of beautiful about this mess of lines, right? That uh, if we start looking at it, it, just starts looking like a kind of an abstract painting. Very cool. Okay, moving on here. This is uh, painting. I'm not sure if is this one that Heidi did or is this a print? So I think this is Lee Kieran. Is this? Um, his style, but I don't know, is this a Lee Kieran print or the original Heidi? I mean, I I really love what you've done here or what he's done or what the printer has done. If this is what you've created, I'm just blown away. I love this artist style. Obviously, this is why we didn't do this exact painting. We did another one on a mountain, um, uh, that was much, much more gray. And I think I did include one of this series in the Dropbox. But, uh, I, I mean, I think you said some, maybe it was in one of these, like, very the more traditional way of displaying as kind of a scroll. Um, or, or not a scroll, but as a, um, as like a, a hanging... Like, cause you could see that they can, they, they can be rolled, right? You often have like a wooden beam underneath here that 
weighs it down and then you have like another one hidden up top here with a little string so that it does make it convenient to like hang and move very interesting I'd be, I'm curious to, to know if that's the original or not so here's another one so Heidi really got into saying you and did I think it post I think last episode we looked at a bunch more that she did based on his work so this is an original saying you and this is her version of it as I said, Sang Yu, great artist that I probably want to revisit again. Remember, Sang Yu was the artist that did the um, the vase of flowers that, that had a kind of a red background that we painted kind of a yellow over top of. Uh, here's Holly's. Um, now, I, I'm trying to remember the story on the Facebook group, Holly, but uh, the, this, I think there was a tutorial that you did or a class where you painted a portrait of someone's face maybe inside here of this astronaut and then you uh, you showed it to your sister whose grandson lives in Switzerland and then I think you swapped out the human face for the cat face and, and may have given it to them as a present either way what, whatever the story is we, we just look at the image it's pretty cool I think you did a pretty cool job. Um, wow. And if that's the original, I mean, you really nailed it. You did a great job of getting the, the, the kind of glow of the lights that are shining right at us and the reflections on the, the glass itself. Um... That is really cool. The one thing I would say... And it's not in the photograph because this is obviously not real it's not like there's cats flying around in space although that sounds kind of cool but I almost feel like I want to see more of a reflection on the mask here just to remind us that this is a, a glass globe that we're looking through so even though it's it makes sense in the photograph. I think I'd want to push that even more. And even consider maybe putting a little bit of the same blue along the edge. You know, I would probably do a little bit of just a line, outline, maybe even on both sides, just to kind of capture that glass. Now, I think I remember something in the comment about you're like oh i think i've done too much here i don't think i want to do any more so maybe you don't want to do any more to it and it is it works really well but if you were considering wanting to kind of because it does it it this mask just feels a little bit empty and blank like those reflections make a big deal because they, they'll help us understand that there's something in front of that cat's face minor detail obviously very very successful otherwise really great i love these patches paw print as a for the canadian flag that is great i don't know if has that been done before or did you just invent something genius because i love it um and then this bone fish bone that's brilliant okay let's move on here um holly look at that that is awesome holly so this is some what is that like a hawk very cool wow i mean really really well done i think the photograph is actually not doing it justice we have another image here really nice oh and you've kind of finished cleaned up that interesting and yeah, it is a little bit strange that the branches don't continue uh, I think th that you know I probably would have pulled this branch down off and continued it at the very least so right now it's just sort of floating in space and I don't maybe this one was done after the other I don't know either way I mean just exceptional brushwork on the bird itself great job and here's another one that holly did here's the tamara de lampica painting her self-portrait um in a i'm trying what was what was this painting named self-portrait in a red or in a green bugatti or something like that 
Um, obviously very, very famous painting. And uh, yeah, great job. Really excellent job. And nice, nice use of sort of the blending to get these reflections. Really, really great job. Let's look here at Judy's paintings she did of Maude Lewis. So we did, uh, we looked at Maude Lewis two years ago around Christmas time. Um, one of the most beloved artists of all time, certainly one of the most beloved Canadian artists of all time, and probably the most beloved maritime artist of all time. Um, and there was a, a great movie, I think it was just called Maude, that came out with um, who are the actors in that film um, Ethan Hawke played the husband and what was her name I think she won the Academy Award for her portrayal of Maude Lewis anyway it has nothing to do with what we're talking about beyond the fact that that's the artist but really well done Judy I think Judy is also another one of our newer members and these turned out awesome wow Great job. I mean, it just feels like so long ago that we did these episodes. It's so neat to see them again. And I love it when people just join the community. And obviously, we've got hundreds to over 200 episodes that we've done together. So if you're interested and you don't like what I'm painting this week, you can certainly go back and, and <laughs> there's more than enough paintings to keep me busy. That's great. These are awesome. Really excellent uh, and then here's the Thomas Kincaid one that, again, we did for I think, Christmas a couple of years ago. That one, that was great. That was also, for me, felt good because I, we were, I was really starting to kind of push the boundaries of what we were doing and kind of moving more from just a pure beginner class to more complex concepts relating to painting, even more specifically like warm and cool colors and how we can use them. Um, to kind of create that glowing look. Wow, and here's Judy's Gustav Klimt. This kind of gives us an idea when we were talking... Where were... How far back did we go from here? Here's Donna's version, right? Just sort of thinking about, again, that chin and the neck and kind of how we can deal with those here. Right, kind of just bringing a bit more... And, you know, this is... Gustav Klimt himself did this, and he was part of his style was maybe stretching out the figure beyond its normal proportions. And, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. There's El Greco is probably, or, or Egon Schiele, who is a friend of Klimt, are two artists who are famous for really dramatically playing with the, the human proportion. That's great. I love all these lines. Oh, wow. That turned out really, really nice. Great job, Judy. Here's May. Here's another another painting. May, great to have you kind of participating again after a bit of a break. And here's the Picasso. The I think the, this is the closest we came to a cubist painting by Picasso. Although I want to do more. And we're going to... There's a few more cubist paintings coming up over the next few months. But, uh, wow, that turned out really great. Again, you can see there's there's a lot of time involved in this painting to get so much of the, like these, the structure in here and all these fine little details. That's great. Uh, this was a hard one for me with the fine details. sharp lines and edges but you certainly did a great job at this is maybe like a Posca pen or something in the background to help which is totally fine it's not considered cheating to use whatever tool is gonna help you make the painting um, and here's Maria's this we did um, this is Claude Monet's impression sunrise Wow, that's cool I like this little bit of more pink in here. Did we use that in ours or is that something you put in there? Then Maria uploaded a video kind of showing using a bit of like a, a water bottle to spritz 
the palette to keep it a little bit wet if it's drying out or you're in a particular kind of dry climate where your paints dry maybe faster than you'd like. Great little tip. Here's Maria did the David Hockney painting that we did. So is that the original? What is, are these two different versions, Maria? What have we got here? Huh. Maybe is this the, your first version of it and then a second version? Either way, they both look great. Wow, and it looks like small canvases too. Are you paint those look like maybe like, what, because uh, if that's the size of a pen, that's like, what, a six by eight canvas or something? And this is maybe eight and a half by 11. I mean, that's, to do all of that on a small canvas, that's pretty remarkable. And here's, what was this? Here's the first one, Maria. What am I looking at here? We've got two. Are these, are these both? So that's definitely Maria's signature. And here's another one. I'm not sure. Maybe I guess Marie's doing going back and oh, maybe Marie's just going back and repainting some of the previous paintings. So here's the Tom Thompson, the Round Lake Mud Bay, which I loved. Right, that was a fun. That whole week we were doing those Tom Thompson paintings. That was a lot of fun. If you're not aware of Tom, who Tom Thompson is, we did five episodes on Tom Thompson. He's he's probably arguably the most important Canadian artist of all time. And he's also the subject of the graphic novel, the biography that I've been working on for the past five years, which will be in stores this time next year. Here's a great tree. That looks like a very Rembrandt-inspired kind of style. Awesome. And maybe I'll just look, want to look here again before I move on from Maria's. I wonder, is this the first one and here's your more refined one? This one definitely looks like it's, there's maybe a little bit more time, or is this one is a little bit more loose? And I'm sorry, I'm sure on Facebook you posted explaining what some of these are, but I, I, we don't have, I don't have that here, but um, it is a great idea to go back now that, especially those of you who've been painting for a while and you're really feeling more and more confident, is to go back and, and try doing one of your earlier paintings a second time. And again, I would say 99 times out of 100, it's going to be vastly superior to the way you did it the first time. Both because you've improved and you're, you're, you know how to handle and mix paint better, but just naturally, even if you did this a painting a second time immediately after doing the first one, it's going to be better just because you've already kind of figured out how to do it, you kind of solved the problem, and then you're just executing it again, maybe in a little bit more of an efficient manner. So these are all good. Oh, some there's um, a lot of a lot of people saying Sanders says he hasn't responded to my email. <laughs> um, yeah, I know, Sandra, you sent me an email like a month ago, and I just, sorry, I... Oh my goodness, so many comments here. Whoa, whoa, okay, I mean, um... Just gonna see if I can skip to any. Was there something somebody was asking me that I haven't responded to? The volume is okay. As I haven't gone mute or anything here. What? I feel like I missed something. Um, Sophia is. There's people talking about. Uh, Lolly's encouraging Sophia to to, to practice with. These streams. Uh, Lolly says, I'm in a similar spot to you after a long time of not painting. I found these streams maybe six months ago and I've learned so much in that short time. Great people too. <laughs> uh, Sophie says, I don't have a fancy computer to send my paintings to to critique. Um, 
you can just take a photo on your phone and, and, uh, and send them directly to Facebook. You don't... I don't think most people have fancy computers to to upload any to upload your paintings to, but because um, um, most of these people are just taking photographs with their smartphone and uploading them directly, so uh, sometimes the quality isn't great or the lighting isn't great. That's I think we're all we can kind of understand that when we look at them. That some of those that explains why some of these. Um, yeah, it's interesting. You could try emailing. Oh, that's you could email them to me, but whether I'll get around to putting them up here uh, is a whole other. <laughs> uh, Lolly says I don't have a computer or Facebook either, so I don't get the critique either. Though I think it would benefit from a lot. Um, but you don't really want to see my paintings anyway. <laughs> um. Do you think you'd be cool with me emailing them? You could try emailing them again. I I get so many emails that uh, I I well, I try to do my best to get to reply to all those emails. It, it drives everybody in my life crazy, but I just I'm all, I'm sort of at capacity <laughs> mentally. So if if I'm in if, if I'm in one of those moments where I have a little bit of clarity. Yeah, definitely. You can. I mean, I'll. If some of you are really need to, I'll keep an eye out for your Sophia and Lolly for your your emails, and we'll try to put them in. I think I might be doing another one of these episodes. I was thinking about doing it next weekend, um, because I'd like to kind of catch up to a little bit to where we are today. And there's we're like we're talking about artwork that we did back in November. All of these were so. But at the same time, sometimes it takes people a while to go back and do some of these paintings. So I don't want to do a whole, you know, episode where we talk about paintings and then only one person's got a painting and then ten of them flood in. So anyway, long story short, let's move on here to Natalie and her portrait of Amanda Gorman. Um, so this is the original and then this is the painting that she's created. I think you've done a, a great job so far. Um, you know, I, painting from photographs is deceptively difficult, and I'm certainly not the best at it either. And th again, that's why sometimes doing a first version just to sort of try to figure it out is really helpful. And then afterwards, you can go back and either continue working on it or do a sep another one. Because sometimes just getting the shadows is really tricky. So what we've got here, I think, is a great start. But we need to kind of amplify, I think, some of the shadows. Like, I think we would darken this area, even though there's some reflected light on her face down here. I think we can certainly darken that. We can widen these nostrils and make the bottom part of her nose darker in that shadow. Um... Her eyes, I think, are actually done pretty well. You know, in the original, she's kind of squinting her eyes, like she's kind of looking into the direct light, which is why we have a pretty strong shadow on her face. So I don't mind that her eyes are more open in your painting versus the original. It, it will probably mean that a little bit less of a likeness will be captured because it might, might not quite look exactly like her. But that's... I mean, I, personally, I have almost zero interest in capturing a likeness. That is certain. There's other people on YouTube who's who's made whole careers out of like reproducing a, a, a likeness quite carefully. I'm more interested in trying to kind of uh, capture like color and emotion and feeling than reproducing photographs exactly. Um, but uh, anyway, a few other things we could think about that, you know, probably these lips could come up a little... Well, if we make the, her nose and nostrils a little bit bigger, one thing is that your, your, the, your lips, you know, the center of your lips should coincide with the center of your nose, right? So if we drop a line straight down, this is sort of where the center of these lips should be so that... If we want to keep 
I, so either this whole mouth needs to kind of shift over a little bit, or which way would it be? For you guys, it would be this way. <laughs> or just in, make the lips, they have to be bigger anyway. So we could just also add a little bit here and, and widen that. The other thing is on her cheek, right now she looks very, very young. I mean, she's the Amanda Gorman is think 15 or six like very young to be as successful as she is again it's just like oh man these kids today but you know her what we have here is this makes her look even younger um because i think what we want is the her cheek because this almost looks like she's got a jawbreaker in her mouth like right where we want that kind of bump if you will to be up higher, closer to the eye, right? If kind of we, as if we draw a line from that bottom, and then kind of carve in a little bit more. I mean, a tiny little details, but they can make the big difference in getting closer to the to to the original. But even just getting this far is a huge accomplishment. So, I mean, I I'm always applauding anyone who's going to try painting at all because it's the moment you pick up a paintbrush and start painting that, that first couple dozen paintings are going to be probably quite disappointing right because it takes a little bit of a while just to get the hang of it just like riding a bicycle for the first time you, you fall you need somebody to help you you got the training wheels you just got to pedal for a while until you kind of get the balance done and then you get the balance done and then Maybe you could take off one of the training wheels and then maybe somebody doesn't have to hold so tight on the back while they run behind you. So uh, here's Pascal. We're, we've got a bunch of paintings by Pascal. So we've got a lot to look at, but we'll kind of go through them quickly here. I mean, I love these butterflies. These are great. And I think one of the great things Pascal's been doing is these short paintings after he's finished a painting with all the paint that's left over on the canvas doing little tiny paintings in a very quick, speedy time to use that paint. And I think maybe also just to to give himself that freedom because he's probably thinking, well, you know, if this paint is just gonna go in the garbage anyway, then, hey, at least I can, I, I have nothing to lose by playing with this paint and seeing what happens. And that's a great p position to be in because a lot of us start overthinking and we're like, well, don't wanna, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to do something I'm not going to be happy with. But if you kind of go in like, hey, listen, this is all just bonus. If it turns out, great. If it doesn't, well, it was going to go in the garbage anyway, so whatever. Right? And then who knows? Maybe you end up creating something you're really, really excited by. I think this is great, great. Um, and I've seen a few other people have been inspired by that, uh, your, your approach there, Pascal. So great. Uh, thank you for sharing that as part of the group. Um, Pascal's here. Here's a Picasso. That's great too. Um, this is also a very famous Picasso with these big wide eyes. Um, I think probably his, his neck looks a little bit thin compared to the original and to his body, but I could be wrong in terms of the original. Here's another one here. Materos Asarian. Um, not familiar with this artist. I'll have to take a little bit of a look to see, to check their work out, but that is wild. These clashing blues and reds in the face is very unusual. So it makes me really curious to see how the original painting looked. That's great. And then Pascal did a whole, here's the original Picasso. I think this is a Picasso. And then he sketched it out and painted it. And I think that's the final version, perhaps. It turned out really good. Let's just see, compared to the original. We obviously have maybe something a little more dramatic here. One thing that's interesting about this Picasso is how much of the pencil lines remain visible. Um. That's interesting. I mean, but I personally, I wouldn't consider this to be one of Picasso's strongest paintings, if this is indeed by Picasso. 
Um, it is a very weird painting. And that's what Picasso's doing. He's just grinding through different techniques and styles and compositions, making literally Picasso at one point had the world record, Guinness Book of World Record record for the most artwork produced because he just was like a machine cranking this stuff out. So it's not surprising there's going to be some hits and misses. Um, it is an interesting idea to, to to try to do that painting. I think we'd probably want to just push the, the blacks a little bit more and get that contrast up, especially down here. I think there was a little bit darker, but that's just my opinion. Here's an... Uh, this is, a, I think, what, Wayne Tebow painting, who's... Who passed away relatively recently, I think? Maybe it was either... Yeah, I think he just passed away over the past year. Um, but uh, great, very famous California artist. Uh, I think he was based in San Francisco. And this is Pascal's version of that. <laughs> and then the uh, flowers. That's funny. Like, turning this into... A <laughs> I'm not sure what, how much longer should I wait. Wait for, for what, Pascal? Uh, here's you got all these panels that you've primed up. You got your imprimatur all ready to go. I like that you're experimenting with different colors, even some that have a bit of a gradation, a gradient on them. I think that's awesome. That's you know, uh, certainly one. You know this. This would be, if you were to have gone into a studio with an, well, I was going to say an Impressionist painter. Some of the Impressionists actually just painted directly onto white canvas. Not all of them, but some of them did. But certainly some would have like a whole studio just full of canvases stacked up like this. They would go, because a lot of them also painted outdoors en plein air, and they would take some of these canvases that are all prepped up like this and go out and start painting directly onto this, do their underpainting, start painting some lines and stuff. So this is sort of like, you know, if you were to go into an Impressionist studio 150 years ago, you'd probably see a whole bunch of panels that are prepped and ready to go, waiting for the artist to go outside to paint. Because back then, when you're in Prematura, you know, you're painting with oil paint, and that could take a couple of days, a weeks for that to dry before you start painting over top of it. So it, you that's why you would see a bunch of them prepped up and ready to go like that. Another thing that Pascal posted is this book um, of uh, kind of classical techni drawing techniques, which is kind of fun. Um, that I've seen many of these images reproduced when I was a student as well. So pretty, you know, very, um, you could, I think, like in our, in the drawing course that I taught, again, it's free here on YouTube, which you can watch right now if you want, if you're getting bored of me blabbing on. Um, but you can watch, like, this is similar to a technique I was, I taught in that course called the block, <clears throat> sorry, called the block in method. There's a whole episode, it's like two hours long, where I talk about using that technique, I demonstrate on how to use that method. Because what you're really doing is working your way from the outside inward, which is the best way. Well, one of the one method, probably the least popular or well-known method, to quickly sketch in an image from life. You really only can use it if you're drawing directly from life, whether it's a portrait, a landscape, an animal, or a vase of flowers, or whatever. But uh, I'm, I'm. Thank you for posting those images, Pascal. Here's a few more. We got. I like this color palette here. It reminds me, again, of um, of uh, Lee Kieran, the uh, the Chinese artist that we had explored back in when was that October or sometime like that? Because he used reds and blacks and whites were were his iconic palette that he used almost exclusively for the majority of his life so i think those turn out really well i love this look at the brush strokes on there pascal that is beautiful really kind of mm, like it you kind of want to just eat it <laughs> that's great 
And I like this too. This is your um, color wheel that you mixed. And I like how you added some, uh, you know, by tinting the pal the each color as you painted. That's interesting. I'm not sure how this works here. I don't know if you explained it in your your post. Hmm. I think I understand what you're doing here. Hmm. Interesting. I've never seen anyone um, do a color wheel like that. So it's always interesting to, to see how other people organize those concepts in their mind. Uh, oops, my mouse. Just lost connection. I thought I charged this up. So I think with this one, I think Pascal, I, first of all, I love the image. I think it looks really cool, this silhouette of these, this elephant and, and child walking through the, the sunset and that big, bold, bright sun. But I think more specifically, you're asking about like a puncture in the canvas and how to deal with that. It's kind of tricky. Um, when a canvas gets bent like that, or it gets poked or a hole through it, there are, you can try to, to fix it, but the but one, the, the thing is if it's like, if you have a canvas like that and it's leaning against the other, it's literally kind of stretching the, the acrylic and it, it can end up permanently holding that shape. You can try to, on the back side, using, let's say, a, an iron, and to try to iron it out. You want to be careful about the surface that it's on. You might want to put, like, some wax paper down, or even probably better would be a, um, uh, uh, not rubber, a silicone, like a, a, which I've used several times when we've done pretty messy paintings, pouring paint and that kind of stuff because if the paint won't stick to the silicone, it could potentially, if you get it, if it gets too hot on the wax paper, the wax might melt off onto the face of your cam canvas, which would be disappointing. So you may want to think of just flipping the painting over and trying to kind of burnish it down with a bit of heat. Again, it could be, it could be dangerous because you could um, uh, cause some damage to the, to the canvas. But yeah, that's that would be. Otherwise, it looks really great. Sorry that that happened to you. There's another old painting chart. I think this is probably what you based your color wheel on. Here, that's cool. I mean, I've seen so many different kinds of them, so it is fun to see different ways of organizing things. I do want to move forward here, so we've got so much art to see. This. Girl, you gave this to your niece to encourage the artistic side. Um, I, that's cool. You made a video of this, which was really neat to see that being painted. I loved that. I loved that. I thought that was really cool, Pascal. I encourage you to do more of that, documenting the whole process. Um, wow, that is cool. What am I looking at? This is uh, the left version is by your niece. Ah, that is cool. Um, interesting. That is cool. You got a very talented niece there, Pascal. Okay, we're now going to look at a bunch by Paula here. And here's Paula. Here's a bunch of her paintings that she's done hung on the wall together. Wow. And since Paula's, I think, done all 200 paintings we've done you must have a gigantic wall filled up with all of these paintings you've done I imagine you can't fit them all so you're probably rotating them in and out I'm so proud of you Paula for for being I mean, I'm grateful also for you uh, keeping me company all throughout the past couple of years every day you're you're like clockwork you're always here with us so uh, it makes me really excited especially to see them all together Sometimes, you know, when we do these and they'll just, if they just go on a shelf or a bookcase somewhere and they just disappear, sometimes it becomes easy to forget how much we've actually done. 
These beautiful horses. I love that. Really nice. Cool. <laughs> I'm not sure what this is from, but I love this tiger. Was this maybe for the year of the tiger? Or is this a small detail of a larger painting? I'm not sure. But great work. That's fun. I don't like what that yellow and those blue dots are. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, here's the one for a tank. I think this might have been um, right after Ukraine was invaded. I'm not sure. The sad cat running away from the tank and the house on fire. Huh. That's cool. Kind of sums it all up. Um, here's this is great, Paula. I love this cat. I think you may even have said like this is the first cat I've painted, or I think in your Facebook post, which is probably not true because we did do it. We've done a number of cat paintings together. So, but maybe this is the first one you've just done on your own. I think that's very cool. I love the little splatters of paint in there too. That really just shows kind of your flexibility and freedom and looseness with the paint. Wow, very exciting, very inspiring. And what do we have here? There's, is that like a jaguar or on the left? And there's, does that say Prince Charles? <laughs> with this white hair that's great and here's Putin that you did that's cool Putin seemed in real life his eyes seem abnormally close together whether that explains anything or not I don't know but I think you kind of captured that here in your portrait and then you're doing some of the drawings I think I think you were doing some of the drawing class as well Paula but Again, this just shows like how talented you are at drawing as well. In fact, I would like to see maybe even more drawings. I know that you, for when we're doing our paintings, you like to draw and then you paint the paintings. It might be worth just doing drawings with colored pencils for a little while and just see how that turns out. Because clearly you're doing an excellent job. Um, like your fabric study here on the top, that's excellent. And the glass and the reflections, the contours, the volume in there. Very good. So here's another one showing more of your paintings that we've done together. Some of them we've you've done all on your own here, like that pickle jar. Let me see, can I zoom in on this? Oops, it won't let me move around. Sorry, but there's that just very cool Paula. Here's a few more. <laughs> What? Uh, just pray God listens. I love that. It's so beautiful. The animal with its hands clasped together and that gorilla. I also just like your backgrounds. The the, the sort of the, the looseness of the paint and those colors, those greens and blues mixing, using warm and cool colors to help give you lots of space. Absolutely awesome. And here's a little bird. That's great. I feel like we need a little bit of shadow by those feet to ground that bird. I'm assuming that bird is standing on the ground and not flying. And I think we just need a little bit of shadow underneath it to anchor it to the ground. And if the shadow is touching the feet, then it tells us that, that the feet are on the ground, right? If, if there's a shadow that's kind of under the feet, it tells us that it's floating a little bit above the ground. Just think about like, I don't know, Apollo 11 and the, the spacecraft landing on the moon. If you see that last like 10 seconds as it gets closer, we see the shadow of uh, the eagle lander approaching and the shadow is small and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and, bigger, and then it touches the lander, right? And shadows can be really, really helpful to help us understand where the light is coming from, what time of day potentially this, where the sun is in the sky, if it's outside, how bright the light is, what kind of light, what what temperature the light is, it tells us how big the object is in case, in this case, the bird. So the shadow could be really, really helpful. And I don't think we really have one in here. And I think putting that would probably go quite a long way. Okay, we're moving on here. We got Ravi here, and um, a portrait. I think this was like three important 
Indian figures here. Bhagat Singh, Subhash Chandra Bose, and Mahatma Gandhi. That is cool. Is this something you created on your own, Ravi? That you just put all these figures together? I love that. That is really cool. I do feel like I kind of want another face in there. Maybe behind the fellow with the yellow hat. Just because if we've got two on one side. Part of me always sort of wants to balance things out a little bit. But I think it looks really cool. I, I almost I feel like potentially we could do even more. Or, or a little bit more time in here. Because it does feel a little bit hastily... Um, executed not that that's necessarily a bad thing but I kind of feel like I don't mind a looseness in a painting a looseness is great I do feel like I want to see um, maybe just a bit more contrast like let's say when it comes to that hat like a little bit more shadow on the forehead um, I think on the I, I, my mouse's battery is dead so I can't point it out but the the eye of the of uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, the the eye that's closest to the center of the image, towards the blue um, sphere, is I think I see a dot in there, but I think we need to. It looks a little bit almost like one eye is closed, and I think I do see the 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 pupil of the eye, but we just need to darken that in. Little things like that that. I think you've got the beginnings of a great painting, but we just might, might just need another like hour to kind of give a little bit more of a finish to it. And here's another uh, version of uh, uh, Impression Sunrise by uh, Claude Monet. Wow, that sun is is much bigger <laughs> than uh, than the original or the, what anyone else did. It just it does give it like a real intense quality. That big, bright orange sun. Um, one of the things we did talk about about this painting was, and this is not something I came up with on my own. This has been part of the literature on, on this painting. Is what uh, Monet did very cleverly in this painting is that that orange sun is actually the same value as the as the the, the kind of gray sky around it. It's a different color, but the value is the same, and which is a little bit confusing. Probably some people who are maybe newer to the channel are like, "What?" But he. We talked about if you convert this painting, the original, to black and white, the sun basically disappears, which is kind of, you're like, whoa, where did it go? Be and him using a different color but the same value causes in our mind a little bit of confusion, like that that sun looks like it's a little bit hazier and sort of disappearing into the, into the sky a little bit. Um... Just sort of a little a neat little trick that Monet was using. Obviously, a hundred years before we had the technology to actually f create, to, to see for sure what he was doing in there. But um, just something to think about that maybe that sun might be a little bit intense. Um, wow. Uh, so here's Richard it says, just like Pascal. I use the paint left on my palette to create a uh, kind of spontaneous painting at the end. That is cool. I love it when you guys are inspired by each other in the community, on the Facebook group. That is really, really neat. That makes me so excited that we can have people from around the world that are gathering together like we're doing right now, or even just on the Facebook group, making connections and friendships, sharing ideas. Oh, that's so cool. And really, like for a, a fast little painting with leftover paint, wow, that's cool. Um, it's interesting, like, you know, the tree on the right there is obviously done very quickly and with a dry brush, probably with just the last little bit of remaining paint on the palette. Um, I'm kind of stuck between thinking should it should you go back and refine it or leave it like that interesting I, I 
I on the top half of the painting I actually really like it's kind of unfinished quality it's almost sort of it gives it like a bit of a blurry thing like we're just looking past it at at the rest of the painting which is much more refined I feel like though when we get further down towards the base of the tree that I want it to be maybe a bit more articulated um, and I bet I don't really know what that would mean I have to think about it. I very interesting. I, again, I love that idea of you guys using an extra paint to do something with at the very end. So here's Robin's painting. Um, I think Robin is fairly new to the community over the past few months. So it's great. To, again, these are great, Robin. So this is it. There's been a bunch of flooding in uh, South Australia, and this is the painting that she made in response to that flooding, which is gorgeous brilliant i don't know if i look at it and immediately sense that that's you know flood water um now that i look i think like oh okay i can see kind of maybe that's water that's overflown the banks and kind of that green strip that's sort of about this level in the painting and how the the purpley gray is sort of breaking up that that line that maybe that's the water that's coming towards us through a garden and we have a lily i think is that what's happening whether the, whether my interpretation is right or wrong i think is kind of irrelevant um but it is a really like i i, I love this painting i the, the fact that i might not know exactly what's going on and if i didn't have the title would i as a title title kind of helps me it also kind of um confuses me because i'm not exactly sure but i also don't mind that as a viewer i don't mind being confused um i so, i sometimes i i like that of kind of like oh i gotta i gotta put a little bit of time into here i gotta do a little bit of thinking sometimes sometimes we want that sometimes we don't want that right it might be the difference between you know late at night are you gonna put on like some sometimes late at night I like to watch a documentary that's gonna be really informative and it's 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 really good for my brain and then there's sometimes late at night I'm like ugh, let's put on some trashy reality competition show like um, what was one well, I found, uh, some something where a bunch of uh, too too hot to handle <laughs> this is what we've been watching, which is just total trash, but also a guilty pleasure, right? So sometimes different paintings can be like that. Sometimes they're just like, they're just fun, like easy, like uh, guilty, empty calories. And sometimes a painting challenges, challenges us and we have to spend a little bit more time thinking about it to try to figure it out. And sometimes we don't have to just like one or the other. Sometimes we can like one at different times, right? I, I really like how that turned out anyway. I'm going to move on. Uh, Sandra here did the Dali painting, which we did probably uh, two years. Did we, we did this at the beginning of the Master Study series, right? So year year and a half ago, I think. Uh, so here's sort of, she had documented the steps in the process here, which I love. That's great. Wow, it turned out great. Here's the detail. We did all of the little ants and the clock looks great. Oh, so I think that's the final version. Wow. Really nice. That that was a painting too. It was also just for me in these classes felt like a, a bit of a just a breakthrough in being able to explain to get something, a painting like this, by a great artist, Dali was, you know, is considered to be like a painter's painter. Like, you might think he's pretty silly or you don't like his images, but he was a great artist from a technical point of view that is, you can't deny. You just, it's like, it's like um, a heavy metal guitarist who can play really great guitar solo. Like, I don't like heavy metal music. But when you see somebody shredding on a guitar like that, that is doing the same sort of 
thing that would make Mozart gasp in awe. It's like, that's amazing. So anyway, to, 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 when we were doing the, the, this Dali, it was like, oh, this is cool. I think we can actually do some more complex paintings in a reasonable amount of time if we just use these basic um, techniques, right? So this is also the Giuseppe Arcambaldo painting here. I think this is, or that's stage one. Here's stage two. I wonder if you finished it or if it's all done. I think I think you're saying it was, might be all done. You know, this is again another one of those ones that could take you a while to do a lot of detail. All of those um, kind of shadows and transitions and on all those volumes of carrots and and uh, grapes and all that kind of stuff. Great work. Okay, I'm motoring right along here. I feel like I'm gonna lose my voice. Um, Uh, Shelly says, or this is, I think this was from a landscape painting class that she took. That looks great. Really great job. We can even see the use of some warm and cool colors in here to kind of, again, help with that, creating that depth here. We've got our warm colors in the very bottom, our ultramarine blue at the closest to the bottom of the painting or closest to us. And there are cooler blues in the sky and in the background, cooler green in the trees, and then the warmer green in the foreground, that yellow kind of orangey, orangey green. Looks awesome. Great job. And the reflections turn out really nice. Yeah. I don't know what, what else to say, but uh, you keep on taking classes from that teacher, whoever they are. They, they know what they're doing, it looks like. And then here's another one. This is interesting here because this is the painting and here's what, I think this is what it was inspired by. And wow, like that, the, the way that you applied the paint, it almost looks like a palette knife or something. The way that sort of very intensely applied paint, whether it's a palette knife or just quick brush strokes, because we feel like the movement really intense. So, um, one thing I would say, let me see if my mouse is charged up. There we are. Is I would consider putting a little bit of a much darker brown. Maybe you don't have to do it on this side, but right here to help pop this tree forward. Because really, this is your foreground in this painting. Like if we look at the original. We have this tree, it's, I mean, in the photograph, it's what is the, the foreground is could be debatable, but what you've decided to focus on is this diagonal and this tree, and you're sort of building it up and really bringing it to the foreground. I feel like I want this to, it to be even more uh, pushed forward with maybe even more white, like pure white, not too much of it, but little blobs of it, and then also darkening right in here. And I think that would help push it just a little bit more forward. Um, those trees, maybe even just trying to define one tree over another, because right now they kind of look like maybe they're, it's one big tree that's missing the top. I mean, again, minor details. I don't. I'm always. I don't want to be like overly critical because I'm again. I'm super excited that anybody's doing anything, but I think. You know, sometimes people get frustrated because they're not sure there's something wrong with my painting. What's going wrong? Why why isn't it doing what I want it to do? So that, that's the, the position I always try to be coming at when I'm looking at, at people's artwork here. Because um, I think having, when I saw the source material, it was like, oh, I think I see what we're trying to do here. Right? Maybe even this tree could be a little bit brighter on top. I don't know. I mean, really cool. I feel like also then we need to do something in here. There's a little bit of a shadow. This, these reflections. It's a tricky painting for sure. It's a tricky composition. It's a beautiful photograph, but sometimes you know trying to paint directly from a photograph can 
can put you give you stitches because it's like it, it can be uh, can be really difficult <laughs> <laughs> I love this, Rochelle. Yeah, finishing a painting of a friend when we went on a canoe camping trip. One of those quiet places that you can only get to on a canoe or kayak. I love that. I know what that's like. Yes, yeah, beautiful. I like. I love these dark kind of reflections. It gives us a sense of water that is is might. It, not it's not an entirely placid uh water because if it was if it was really totally calm we would probably see because these tell feel more like ripples like maybe it's kind of a little bit windy and we have the waters kind of picking up uh because we otherwise you wouldn't you'd either have bright reflections from the sky and you this would be totally placid um so there it's a little bit pretty dr not dramatic but it does, it does tell me that there's the water is maybe more agitated, maybe more than you want it to be, to convey that idea that I think you're going after of this of a very serene water. Um, that's just my thoughts, because I could see the sky being kind of because the sky is a little bit overcast. So I would kind of think maybe I like that you have the same color in the sky and the water, but I feel like the sky could be a little bit brighter. <laughs> I guess I'm just a sucker for bright poppy colors, right? That's just me and my my personality. Um, so I think here we're looking at Charmaze here, kind of close to the end, and then we're just a few more paintings I wanted to, to wrap up on. So I think we'll be wrapping up in about um, 10 minutes or so. So if you have any final questions, put them in the chat there and I'll review them right before we go. Uh, so here's Charmaine. This is, I think this is the first version and then this is the second version, I think. So I think you lightened up the background a bit. It also, the image itself just looks a little bit brighter, I think. Um... Gosh, you know, it's hard to say which one is better than the other. I do... I kind of like them both for different reasons. Like, I, I'm not, I don't think one is worse than the other. The, I, I mean... Gosh, I've, I mean, it's so subjective. I think... The, obviously, when the darker one, the high, the, the the flowers tend to pop more because they're they're against a dark background. So when we have the highlights on the flower, it makes those flowers like there's quite, there's an increased amount of contrast. The contrast here is is lowered. I don't think it makes it necessarily a bad or or worse though. It's just maybe a little bit more of a subtle effect. Yeah, I don't know. I, it's, I do. I, either way, I I really like the way the background is painted. I like these horizontal and vertical brushstrokes. It reminds me, you know, Van Gogh did that a lot, to to, to just to give the background some texture. Often people, the backgrounds are just empty, blank, solid colors, and Van Gogh I think is one of the first artists to really activate what we call the negative space, right? So you're, you're in, the, in a painting like this, you have your positive shapes, right? That they, you know, like I'm a positive shape. <laughs> At least I like to think of myself as a positive shape. Um, and then the area around me is negative space, right? So here we have positive shapes and negative space, right? And Van Gogh was really one of the first to really activate the negative space um and to and to really give it life and that's you know that's one way we, when we like um if we think of like van gogh's art probably the most iconic thing we can think about is the way that he paints the skies and the swirls like in starry night whereas a thousand years of artists before him the sky would just be a, maybe a 
blue or a black and some stars painted in there. Van Gogh transformed it and he painted the whole cosmos full of life and energy and it gives a sense of like everything is connected, right? So here, putting that texture in there, I love. Even in the darker one, there's still lots of texture. I almost feel like I want this more texture on this side too that you've got here, but I think it's I think it's done. I'm not saying you need to do more. I'm just saying I really like one part of it. And maybe sometimes it's nice to have just one really really good part on its own and not overwhelm people with goodness. So this is uh, Pan Yulang or Yulang Pan. Ours um, I'm not familiar with, so that's really exciting. I appreciate Charme uh, you opening my eyes to this artist here. So this is the original art that she made. And this is Charmy's interpretation, recreation of that same painting. Now there's two on the Facebook. This might be the first one because I see a little bit more detail in the flowers above. Very subtle difference between those, those two. That is cool. So that's the original and that's your version. Um, I think just like I do, I tend to amp up the colors a little bit so it is a little bit brighter than the original, which has got a little bit more contrast, a little bit darker values in there, in here. Do you need to do that maybe? I mean, you've certainly done it really well in here. Maybe that could be darker. It's hard to say. That is a really cool painting. I like this one a lot too. Um... I'm gonna add her to the list. Okay. Yeah, I don't, what, what could I say about that? I think it's very cool. And then, so we're gonna look here. This is a, a, a photograph that Charmé then transformed into this painting, which is awesome. <laughs> That's so great. Oh my goodness. That is awesome, Charmé. I'm so proud of you. So that's, this is what you were working from. That is really nice. Absolutely excellent um, portrait. Really cool. And I think, you know, it's. I think it's a flattering painting of her. Um, I think you've you've done the the color on the face and in the hair in the skin tones. Really, really well done. Um, she even sort of, you, you sort of captured a bit of the kind of her smile and the eyes. That is great. I love these very subtle pinks and purples in there. Wow, great job. Her hair. Yeah, that's cool. The one thing I think is, is you know, the, the way that you've positioned this with the all this space up here in these these lines that is a really interesting compositional choice to, to leave so much room at the top and to put the face in the center that is definitely an a uh, maybe a less common approach usually you'd probably do something maybe more like that that would be probably most uh, typical kind of approach. Oops. Um, but the fact that that's not what you did, and in fact you, that reminds me, it reminds me of, of Tamara de Lempica. She did um, some portraits like this of other women in her life or people, mostly women. There was a few men she painted, but mostly women that she was inspired by. And she would also kind of compose them in this in this way where we sometimes had a little bit more space around the top of the head, which I don't know why she did it. And I'm not sure why why you did it, but one of, the, I, I mean, there's, I just always, I'm always trying to interpret. I'm an interpreting machine, as I think most human minds are, trying to make sense of everything. And, um, but uh, the, the sort of narrative that, that I think one could come up with, uh, it, that is this idea of, of um, like 
they're, they're, one might say that it is kind of generous and, and per, allows the space for her to grow or for, or for her thoughts and feelings. It gives her agency to kind of expand into... Um, because I think, you know, women are sometimes taught to kind of make themselves smaller and to have, you know, just to with body language and everything and w when interacting with groups is to not be too loud and to, to be quiet and not to talk back, you know, all these kind of outdated kind of, you know, very misogynist ideas. So there's something kind of nice about giving her that room to expand and to breathe. Now, I could just be, you know, uh, uh, making noise... <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do. I anyway. I just think it's it's very interesting, and that's just how I interpret it. So, very cool. So let's. Um, I want to look at a few more paintings here, and maybe before we go too much further. I do want to try to get to a whole bunch of the questions that you guys have here because I just see this the chat is full of things so um whoa uh I'm not sure how far back to go so many like 150 comments or so here let me just try quickly catch up to see if there's anything that a lot of awesome, super supportive comments. That's so cool, how sweet you guys are to one another. That is like, it just makes me so happy that we've all found one another. During the course of the pandemic, all these wonderful people have come together to create great art, and inspire one another, and to push one another. And all of the beautiful things that you guys say to one another to support one another as we're looking at each other's work, that's just so exciting and so generous. Such a beaut just makes me happy for humanity <laughs> that there's like in the face of all the darkness that seems to be surrounding us that there's um, so many people who have decided to focus on positivity right and and to and to celebrate our the things that are are common between us rather than to uh, focus on the things that 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 differentiate us right um, wow, look at all these great, great, great people supporting. Um, wow. <laughs> Sandra says her Archimbaldo painting, she calls her Veggie Man, is still in progress. That's pretty funny. Veggie Man, I love it. I don't, Veggie Man. Veggie Man and Pascal wonders if there's a fruit woman? in the picture. That's funny. Um, Lolly says, I'm going to be having some beautiful dreams when I go to sleep after seeing this. These are awesome pictures. I feel you, Paul, or, uh, Lolly. That's great. Wow. Okay. So let's just look at the last few here, which I just kind of saved to the end because I think they're really inspiring. So again, and, and not that other things we have seen are, are inspiring, we're just trying to like create some sort of ending to all of this magic we've been experiencing the past three hours here. So here's a painting by Deborah. I love this. <laughs> this feels very Canadian, which is a lot of what many people in Canada are, have been experiencing. And then this version, I love, I love that. Um, you know, obviously there's many details that are missing here, but I, you know, I love these glasses that are very foggy. Anyone, I, I wear contacts, but and sometimes I wear my glasses, and if you had to go outside in the cold weather, you know those glasses fog up instantly. <laughs> so that's pretty funny. I love that. Um, I, I like how just sort of kind of very simple everything in the background is. Really cool. I just think that something about this painting just gave put a big smile on my face. That's why I want to share it at the end here. 
I also thought, um, I think uh, Heidi has posted art or quotes from this book a few times. Uh, one continuous mistake, and you know, this is ostensibly for writers, but a lot of books that are about creativity apply to to people really of to all of us, I think. But you can you certainly transplant it to um, to art as well. And here's this quote that she highlighted. If you emphasize the product, you are selling yourself short. Products have a shelf life, but you don't. Your soul is boundless, and when you emphasize the process, problems settle themselves. That's awesome. And that's I'm, I, I know I'm a broken record, and I'm always telling people, like, don't worry. I mean, the, it, if you focus on the process and you have fun in the process, if a good painting ends up coming out of that process then that's that's great but if you're having fun in the process and the painting that comes out of that process is like meh or maybe not something you're super happy with then it's like well whatever you know it's sort of like well i'm just i was thinking about like you go to disneyland you know if you have if you have um a great time all day but you know it's sometimes on those rides that take a picture of you and the picture's not all that great well, if you're focused on the fact that you had a great time all day, but the photo on the ride that you they try to sell you for fifty dollars or whatever isn't that great, then you're just like, meh, it's a bad photo. Who cares? I'm not going to buy it. But it, maybe the photo turns out great. And you're like, whoa, that's an amazing photo of us on the roller coaster. Let's buy that. It shouldn't really change the experience of that whole day at Disneyland or or wherever you might go, right? I don't know. That's an analogy off the top of my head. I don't know if it makes any sense, but um, let's see here. Uh, this here is another painting. This is by Judy. I thought this was just absolutely jaw-droppingly gorgeous painting. Whoa, Judy! Oh my goodness! This is. I love the format too. I like this really long, extended format. It seems to work really well for this chosen imagery. Oh, this just gives me shivers thinking how beautiful it is. And that all of those details, the details in the turtle. I love how the, you know, we've got sort of two different approaches to the way you painted it. Like the background is kind of this blended, um, uh, gradient. And then the turtle itself is painted in a dramatically different way, almost a kind of cubist approach with this very contrasting kind of shapes that are interlocking with one another, like puzzle pieces, which is very stylized, right? I mean, it's certainly not realistic, but there's something about the amalgamation of those two styles, keeping one into the background and putting one into the foreground, which works very effectively. Like it really pulls this turtle into the foreground. It makes it feel like it's moving towards us and exploding out of the canvas. I think it's gorgeous, Judy. I think you gotta do more of these, whether they're more, maybe more underwater scenes like this. I don't know, but I think you've, you've established a high bar for yourself and set out a pathway that I would love to see you continue. Maybe, again, same format, Maybe the next one is uh, a different... Maybe it's more turtles. If you really like turtles, do more turtles. But maybe it's some other fish that you really like. Maybe like a school of brightly colored fish or a stingray or on and on and on. Mm, chef's kiss. Beautiful. And then I wanted to... Where do we want to... Let's, let's go here. So I love these photos that Laurie, you posted here. And I, I, sorry, I don't remember the, the, the story behind these. Um, if this is your daughter or granddaughter or niece or next door neighbor, I apologize. I can't remember. Um, I, first of all, just a beautiful child. Uh, just a, maybe a couple years older than our daughter. Really sweet looking kid. And then I love you did this painting of her that's a gorgeous painting oh that is so cool and then you did another one <laughs> this is so beautiful i love that you know here's just this kid in this beautiful 
dress, standing in the kitchen, and then you've taken it, and now we're, we're like in a totally different world, right? We're now, it's like the Petit Prince on some other world with this butterfly next to her. That is so sweet. And then, um, and then we have her here with the painting in the background. And maybe this is a painting that she made herself or maybe with your help. I love that. And then the two of you guys celebrating together. Oh, it's just so beautiful. I love it so much. That kind of thing is just like, oh, that is so sweet. That's so great. Okay, well, I think that brings us pretty close to the end. So I just wanted to kind of um, just remind everyone, if you found this at all helpful, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel and letting your friends know if you're painting along with me. Upload your photos to the Facebook group. Join the Facebook group, and if you want to leave a small donation, here's a way that you can do that. So thank you, everyone. Wow, I am blown away by all of the great work that you guys have been doing. It's so inspiring to me. It makes me want to do more and more another couple hundred of these episodes. So I'm, I'm, I'm just, yeah. I, I often think, like, I don't even know what to say in these moments because I'm so lucky to, to be surrounded by so much talent and so much energy and passion. It helps me remember why I get up every day and, and paint, right? So thank you, all of you. So, we'll be back on Tuesday. We're going to be doing a painting by David Shrigley, Shrig Shrig and who is who's a, a, a probably not too much older than I am, a British artist, and we're going to have a lot of fun doing some really cool, very simple paintings that are going to look really cool. It's for our most beginner painters, but, I mean, even Emma... I'm, I'm assuming this is Emma here, will be able to make a painting like that um, with us. So I look forward to having you join us. And then on Thursday, we're going to be doing a very, very famous Claude Monet painting of haystacks. So that's going to be really fun as well. Okay, everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening and your weekend. Um, take a moment to think how grateful we are to, to be free and to be able to to, to enjoy each other's art like this not very many other places on the earth right now in in ukraine they don't have that that opportunity so thank you everyone we'll see you guys on tuesday have a great night i'll talk to you soon